So uh, I'm hoping that you guys see the big presentation page and you don't see my, my notes or anything yet. Um, yeah, so welcome to the uh, Certified Arborist Exam Review course. Uh, as always, understanding the biology or understanding the science behind tree care is what's going to allow you a, a much deeper understanding in the decision-making processes that we'll discuss uh, throughout the next several weeks. Um, so please, if you have uh, comments or questions and you'd like a little deeper understanding, uh, please feel free to email me. Here is my email address uh, so it doesn't get lost in the amongst the other emails if you could make the subject line the ISA certification uh, exam review that'd be quite helpful. Hopefully you guys have already read your study guide and this truly is a review course and not your initial step. Uh, this is it's important because we're not going to cover absolutely everything but um, so we're just going to touch on the topics that have been sort of sticky in the past and things that people like a little deeper understanding of. This is the certification guide that you should be using. There is another one that's floating around out there. It has a black cover on it. That one's no longer in use. This is the new one. So make sure that you have this one. Uh, in addition uh, to this, I recommend that you purchase a copy, a complete set of the ANSI Z133.1 safety standards for tree care operations. Um, they are tremendously helpful. Another thing that's going to be very um, helpful to you. Yes. Rob, I'm sorry to interrupt. It does look like you are showing your notes uh, on the side. So it's just a little smaller. All right. I apologize. Thanks for letting me know. Let me see. Boom. Does that look right, Neil? That's perfect. Thank you. Carry on. Sorry about that. Yeah. So uh, here you'll see that um, we have the complete set of the ANSI A300 regulations. The material that we're going to study over the next several weeks is derived from several uh, seminal books. One is Dr. Alex Shigo's Touch Trees. Uh, another is his tree biology book and some of the mechanics that we'll see in here will be from Sharon Lilly uh, as well as Klaus Medic. Um, I strongly encourage you to read some of the original source work. It'll definitely help you to have a much deeper understanding uh, of what the study of arboriculture is all about. Throughout this program, we will also constantly refer to the uh, ANSI A300 specifications. So I strongly uh, encourage you to uh, purchase these as well as the ANZ Z133. And we'll go back and talk about those as we go along. But if you have these, uh, you know, some of the test material comes directly from these manuals uh, verbatim. So if you'd like uh, a little deeper understanding, again, this is the place to go. So what are we going to start with? What are we going to talk about uh, today? It's going to be cell structure and composition. What exactly are meristems and what do they do and where do they exist? Uh, we'll talk about uh, how differentiation gives rise to buds, leaves, wood, and roots. Uh, the rise of the vascular system. We'll talk about mycorrhizae and the development of the root system. What photosynthesis and respiration are and what they have to do with each other tree growth and development, then we'll talk about compart the theory of, compartmental of compartmentalization of decay in trees, also known as the CODIT model, and then we'll wrap up with uh, palm anatomy and physiology. And now it won't go forward. Great. <laughs> Here we go. So what makes a tree? Uh, trees are large woody plants with a single main trunk, typically. They are long-lived. They are compartmentalizing perennials. Uh, compartmentalizing is how they respond to injuries. 
and what they do uh, to minimize the impact of decay. Uh, and they are long lived, otherwise a perennial. Uh, you know, again, why do we need to know all of this stuff? Well, one must know how things should be to be able to identify if they're broken. This is especially helpful in plant health care in the process of diagnosis. Uh, and then is there something I can do about it? We will find that many problems in the tree world um, look the same, but have several different causes. Uh, so it's helpful to know what's uh, what happens specifically to each kind of tree, what it's supposed to look like, what environment it's supposed to grow in, things like that. Um, and so understanding that sort of genetic foundation, you know, helps us to understand how that tree is going to respond to external stimulus um, and know how well it's supposed to do. So anatomy, morphology, and processes. See, component parts of a tree, we talk about anatomy, that's just the science of the structure of animals and plants. Morphology is the study of the forms those things take. Uh, so, you know, anatomy would be, you know, the branch, the twig, the leaf, but what the branch, twig, and leaf look like and where and why they form is morphology. Uh, then we'll talk about physiology. This is the function, what it does. Uh, what's the biological process, the physical process, and the chemical process. So we're going to start at a, at a fairly small level. Uh, the, the level does get smaller than the cell. However, cells are the basic building blocks of all living creatures. Um, so we'll, we'll start at the cellular level. And in plants, uh, cells, when they arise, are undifferentiated, which means they can become practically anything within, a, within the realm of being a, that plant. So new cells arise from the division of existing cells. And in trees, this happens in a very specific part of the tree called the meristem. And there are meristems out at the branch tips and in the root tips. Uh, there's also meristems uh, in the vascular tissue, uh, secondary meristem, and we'll talk about those as we go along. So after a cell is developed, that cell becomes sort of fixed in three-dimensional space. It's, it's always going to be wherever it was developed, and that's kind of a hard concept to understand. A lot of people think that uh, when a tree comes up out of the ground, you might be able to tie a rope onto a low branch and as the tree grows up it'll pull the rope up into the air and maybe you can have a nice swing and you would have never had to have climbed the tree to put the rope on, over the branch but that's not how uh, trees develop so wherever that branch arises off of the original stem it's going to be that same height off the ground its entire life uh, same is with the cells inside of that branch so they stay wherever they they're made. They're fixed in that sort of three-dimensional space. Once the cell is made, it undergoes differentiation. So that cell might become a leaf. It might become stem tissue. It might become vascular tissue. It might become root tissue. Um, so it, it, can, it, it undergoes this process of change uh, and, and allows them to assume a, a variety of functions. Cells with similar structure and function, arrange themselves uh, into tissues. So the cell is going to give rise to a tissue, and then tissues give rise to organs. So here we have leaves, stems, roots, flowers, and fruit. These together sort of form the, the organs of the tree. Uh, you know, obviously this is where we're going to find these things. Uh, the foliage, the green stuff on the outside of the canopy is held out there by the infrastructure of the crown. Uh, this is where we'll find the branches. Uh, the branches smaller into twigs or larger into limbs or even larger into leaders, finally into a trunk. Uh, going down into the root system, we're going to have... Uh, you know, some small, made some large diameter roots down at the base. Um, 
there may or may not be some type of tap root out there. Um, we'll talk about tap roots as we go along as well. Uh, and then all the way to very, very fine uh, part of the, the tree called the root hairs. Uh, these are practically microscopic. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about those two types of meristems again. So primary growth has to do with cellular elongation. So this is going to produce those cells on the root shoots and the branch shoots. So this is what goes that that elongation that you might see in the springtime when the leaves first emerge and you see this long shoot of growth. Uh, that is tip elongation. The tree is getting taller. It's getting, uh, the canopy is getting wider. The root system is getting longer. Uh, that is elongation. Uh, and it happens in a place called the apical meristem. Uh, apical means that it's out at the tip. So at the very top of the tree, you're going to have the apical meristem or out at the tip of the branch, there'll be an apical meristem for that particular branch. Uh, so it just uh, primary growth is always going to be taller canopy, wider canopy, uh, longer root system. The other type of meristem produces secondary growth. And this is, uh, you know, as, as I got older, I got much bigger in diameter. That would be my secondary growth. Uh, after adolescence, I stopped getting taller and I just started getting uh, heavier. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, an increase in diameter. Meristems uh, within the stems, branches, roots, this is where the wood is produced. It's where all that xylem tissue gets, gets packed away. Uh, we'll, we'll go into depth and in all this stuff. Uh, but this is what allows the tree to grow larger. Um, one thing to note is that palms lack secondary growth. You might see that on a test somewhere. So keep that in mind. Palms lack secondary growth. So really palms can only get taller. They don't get bigger in diameter. So under a microscope, uh, here we have a root tip. Uh, so this portion out here is called the root cap. Uh, the, these cells are pretty sturdy. Uh, they, they produce a, a protein lubricant that helps uh, the root tip to push its way through the soil uh, as it explores and exploits the soil. Right behind that root cap, you see where uh, the cells are very, very small. This is the meristematic area. Uh, this is the primary, the apical meristem of this particular root. And so as the root grows in this direction, uh, new cells that were produced get left behind. Uh, so as it moves this way, you can see where these cells, they get a little larger before they start hardening off. Uh, as they go through differentiation, uh, as they figure out, hey, I'm, I'm with root tissue, I'm going to become a root. So uh, here is an example of a lateral meristem. So we have uh, a tree and we're looking inside of the heart of the tree. We see uh, the, in the inside part, the heartwood. This is very old xylem tissue that's not really used anymore. We get into what we know as the sapwood. Uh, this is active xylem tissue, but it's not the current year's vascular tissue necessarily. Then we get out to the cambium. The, we've Hopefully you've, you know, you've read, you might even have questions about the cambium, but this is the area that produces the new cells. This is what makes the tree grow larger in diameter. On this side of the cambium, it's going to produce xylem cells. On the other side of the canopy, it's going to produce phloem cells. And then outside of the phloem, we're going to have the bark, and we'll look at that uh, a little more. So this occurs everywhere uh, above ground in the tree. It even happens on uh, the, woody, the woody root system. Uh, so this is the secondary growth. It allows it to get larger. Apical growth allows it to get taller. So here's a little closer look at the cambium. Again, here's that xylem tissue that we were talking about that's later going to form the, the heartwood. Uh, we have the cambium. 
that zone, that meristematic, secondary meristematic zone. Uh, outside of that, we have the phloem that we talked about. Uh, outside of that, we have the bark. So this is a little more in-depth look at the bark. Uh, so we have the, the cortex, the phalloderm, the cork cambium, cork cells, uh, the epidermis, and the cuticle. Uh, this all comprises the bark. Um, so uh, the bark can make some films inside. Uh, these are really not vascular types of these are more defense mechanisms that the bark can create um, but this is uh, the phloem is the outside of the actual uh, conductive portion of the vascular tissue uh, it's a very very thin sheath of cells uh, this cambium is uh, only a cell or two thick it's, and it's, it's just looks if you were to look at it in person it just looks like a kind of a film and again, it's going to produce xylem tissue to the inside and phloem tissue to the outside. Uh, the core cambium, uh, again, this sort of uh, area that's here uh, produces the barheroderm uh, or this, uh, this phalloderm and cortex combined. Uh, the outside portion of these are old, uh, old cells. The cuticle is sort of a waxy covering that we'll talk about in a little while that uh, helps to regulate soil, I mean, uh, uh, water loss, moisture loss. So let's talk a little more about cells. Plants have hard cell walls. This is the distinction between plants and animals. Plants have very hard cell walls that are fixed. Um, and animals have soft cell walls. If a cell in an animal dies, it is replaced. So you have what's referred to as cellular replacement. So if you cut yourself, uh, you're going to form a little scab. And under that scab, uh, the tissue is going to, uh, your body is going to get rid of the damaged tissue and it's going to start building replacement tissue. Uh, and then eventually the scab falls off and you have clean looking skin under it. Uh, this does not happen in plants. There is no cellular replacement. This is a very important concept to understand that it's the basis of the CODIT model. Um, so once a cell is damaged, it's permanently damaged. Uh, cells are fairly easy to damage, as we'll see throughout these lectures, that it doesn't take much uh, compression damage hitting it with a, with a vehicle or a uh, even putting your foot on the trunk of a soft or a thin bark tree can damage those cells under it and lead to cellular damage. That damage is never replaced and it can lead to decay. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll talk about that more as we go along. There are two main components that give uh, cells their structure that show up in plant cells that do not show up in animal cells. This is cellulose. This is the structural compound. It's the most common organic compound on earth. Uh, this provides the architecture of the different cell types. Lignin gives it strength and rigidity. It's what allows trees to grow tall. From an evolutionary standpoint, trees used to just be sort of a flat film on the ground <laughs> that could uh, photosynthesize. It's over eons of evolution, they, they developed um, this relationship with lignin and cellulose to be able to produce stiffer cells uh, like these blocks that we see today and allows trees to grow very tall. So we'll talk uh, some xylem here. The primary function conducts water and dissolved minerals. That's the first thing to think about. It's going, this is what comes when the elements get dissolved in water in the soil, the tree's root system is going to absorb these things and it's going to bring it in like, it's like the grocery store. The roots go out and they find the necessary elements that are required to produce starches through the process of photosynthesis. So this stuff has to get from the soil up into the canopy where the leaves are. Uh, and it does that through the xylem. So xylem you could think about as moving things up and out to the leaves. Uh, we, we talked about xylem having structural properties. It supports the weight of the tree. Uh, wood is fairly weak in compression strength. 
meaning squeezing it together, and it's a very strong and tensile strength trying to pull it apart. Uh, we'll see how that's important a little later. Um, xylem is also responsible for storing carbohydrate reserves. Trees produce an enormous amount of energy. These leaves, when the sun is out, are constantly manufacturing uh, carbohydrates, known as a photosynthate. Uh, the, the product of photosynthesis is a photosynthate. So um, not only does it produce starches, it produces other ch chemical compounds that we'll talk about. But for now, it's important to understand that the trees produce a lot more energy than they use, and that energy has to get stored away somewhere. Earlier, we saw a diagram of sapwood. Uh, that sapwood is the living part of the xylem tissue, but not necessarily conducting uh, things up and down the tree anymore. Uh, it's more of a lateral movement. Uh, so carbohydrates can get stored in all of that sapwood. Um, and then it's also a primary component in the codet model, the compartmentalization of decay in trees. So therefore, it's, it's part of the defense mechanism against decay. We say that uh, trees are a complex of tissues. Uh, so xylem tissue, again, we talked about the heartwood on the inside. Heartwood is non-living xylem tissue. It's usually a different color. Uh, and over time, depending on how big the tree is in diameter, uh, you know, the heartwood could, could become a big portion of the tree. And we refer to that uh, as the apoplasm, the non-living tissue. Uh, that sapwood or that outer part of the tree where, store, where starches are stored or consumed, where active transportation still occurs, this is the symplasm. This is the living tissue. So even though it's all xylem tissue, it can both still have a function even after it's passed, even after it's uh, no longer alive. So there's symplasm and apoplasm. So um, gymnosperms or conifers are a little different from angiosperms. Uh, so angiosperms are deciduous trees typically. Um, uh, gymnosperms are conifers, meaning cone bearing. Um, so their vascular tissue is, like I said, a little different in a conifer. Uh, the tracheids conduct water and provide mechanical support. They are elongated, dead cells with pointy ends and thickened uh, walls. So, you know, this is, this is a cross section of pine. So we're looking straight down on top of it. So these, these bigger vessels could be uh, tracheids. Uh, these small little cells, these are um, uh, just part of the vascular, part of the xylem tissue that conducts moisture. Um, and notice that there's, you can see where they get more packed going in this direction and then they get larger on this side of it. Uh, this would be the transition uh, year to the annual transition. So from this point to this point would be one uh, one growth increment, that's how much it grew in one given year. Uh, so it starts off in the spring growing like gangbusters, so the cells are very large. Uh, as we approach winter and shorter and shorter daylight hours, these vessels get smaller and smaller until the, uh, it goes into practically dormancy. Even though most uh, conifers are evergreen, they don't necessarily have a lot of secondary development uh, in, the, in the middle of the winter. But you still notice that there are things that cross over this boundary. These are called ray cells. Uh, we'll talk about the ray cells a little bit. Um, but for now, we think about these, these big tracheids, these larger vessels in there uh, that help to move things up and down, up the tree. Uh, they also provide fibers that are the mechanical strength. Parenchyma are living cells that are interspersed among the other xylem cells. Uh, they can store carbohydrates in the outer layers of the xylem. They can defend against decay and have a, a structural function across the grain. Uh, so these parenchyma cells really help to help the tree to react. They, they're part of that active uh, transport system. 
Uh, again, this is a cross section of pine, shows the parts. There's three annual growth rings here, uh, with one complete one in the middle. So here's a, an example of a hardwood or an angiosperm. Uh, there are some tracheids, uh, fibers. Uh, there's parenchyma. The parenchyma is uh, more abundant in hardwoods and arranged very close to the vessels. So here, this is under great magnification. You can see these vessels greatly enlarged. Uh, vessels, however, are the primary conducting elements. They are stacks of dead hollow cells that form very long tubes. So in the, we don't see these in the conifer. Uh, we see these in the, uh, in the hardwood. So think of it as a very long straw uh, that just a constant column of uh, water with dissolved minerals in it that uh, can pull things up. Uh, this is a little different from the hardwood that it, I mean, from the pine where it pulls it up a little bit, moves it over, pulls it up a little bit more, moves it over, pulls the moisture up a little bit more. Uh, in hardwoods, it's sort of a continuous column. Uh, this is a more efficient way of getting lots of moisture into the tree in a fairly short amount of time. It's a, it's a more efficient way of doing it. Uh, again, you can see some of these ray cells here that uh, that pop about. Uh, let's see what else can we see? There's lots of fibers, obviously, in here. This is a, this is a walnut. Walnut is pretty dense wood. That's why we like to use it as furniture. Uh, so that's why this is magnified so much to see these. You can almost pick these vessels out with your naked eye if you're looking at something with large, uh, a rapidly growing tree with open vascular tissue. Uh, red oaks are a pretty good example. A young red oak, if you look at a cross section of it, um, these things are very obvious uh, to find without a magnified lens. So cells can, uh, vascular cells can arrange themselves in, in two basic formations. One is ring porous and the other is diffuse porous. Uh, ring porous, these are wide vessels formed early in the growing season and narrow vessels formed later in the season. Typical, you would see this in elms, oaks, and ash. Uh, more often than not, you'll see ring porous trees in drier environments. Uh, diffuse porous trees, uh, these vessels are sort of uniform in size throughout the whole growing season because moisture is uh, fairly constant in the soil to, to these species, trees, native environment. So the maple, the plane tree, the poplar would typically be found uh, in lower lowlands type areas. Not always, but typically. Uh, here we have an example of, uh, of a ring porous tree. So you can see the vascular vessels uh, in the growth increment are very large in the spring and they get smaller and smaller as it goes through to dormancy and then starts over again in the spring. So again, this is, you're seeing parts of three different uh, growth years. This is the diffuse porous tree. So again, we have one, two, three, four years uh, shown here. Notice that the size of the vessels are relatively the same from spring to fall. And so that's why it's the, they're sort of evenly distributed. It's just diffuse. Um, again, some vessels under magnification. Uh, to go over heartwood again, you know, you've got uh, apoplasm uh, and symplasm here. So this, the sapwood is where you're going to have active transport still occurring, active storage of starches, consumption of starches all happens out here in the sapwood. The heartwood tends to be discolored. Uh, you see lines, you see some of these ray cells crossing across, but really they end right where that boundary is. Uh, so this, uh, this sapwood cannot draw anything out of the heartwood area and vice versa. So growth rings, uh, it's important to, to call them growth rings or growth increments what might be a little more appropriate. There are a number of things that can create 
uh, rings in the tissue. Uh, there's a wounding at a certain period in the growth year can create its own annual ring or what looks like an annual ring, but it's really just a ring. So when we are discussing the particular aspect of growth rings, we are looking at the increment, the amount it grows from spring to dormancy. Uh, it'll be visible in a cross section. Uh, it's a result of seasonality uh, in the xylem tissue created by the cambium. Uh, in those ring porous trees, we talked about those large vessels. Sometimes that's referred to as early wood. These are cells that are produced early in the season and late wood cells are produced uh, later in the season. So this would be uh, early wood and late wood, all in the same growth increment. Uh, conifers do not have vessels uh, and therefore are non-porous. So again, we, we talked about how moisture gets up in a conifer, it sort of zigzags from side to side on these, these short uh, tracheids. In, uh, in the hardwoods, we have uh, those constant tubes. So because it's a constant tube, it means it could be porous. Uh, however, hardwoods have the ability to produce a chemical or a compound called tyloses that can plug that to tissue. So not all uh, hardwood is porous. A good example is the difference between a red oak and a white oak. Red oak is porous and white oak is not porous. Uh, so conifers uh, are non-porous because of, because of those factors. Uh, growth rings may not be annual for tropical trees. So if you think about a tree growing uh, close to the equator, there's really no seasonality there. Uh, because of that lack of seasonality, you're not going to see an early wood and a late wood. You're going to have constant growth throughout the growing season, which makes it very difficult to determine how old a tropical tree might be. Uh, so one of the ways that they did that was they put these little incremented spikes into the trunk of a tree and they came back and measured as that secondary growth uh, occurred. It would encompass that, that graduated spike and they could figure out the growth rate. It's from the growth rate and the size of the tree. They could sort of calculate how old these trees are. Uh, but there is no way to really directly look and see. Uh, you won't see those growth rings in the, in the tropical trees. The further away you get from the equator, however, you do begin to see them. Uh, palms, because they do not have secondary growth, uh, will not have growth increments uh, laterally because there's no xylem there. So not all conducting elements transport water. Uh, you know, we talked about that sapwood. So in the sapwood, even though you can transport things, it might not transport water. This is living tissue. Uh, it might just transport, the bulk of this is just gonna transport starches laterally and not up and down. It's really just the current year's vascular tissue that you're going to conduct things up into the canopy. Uh, with conifers, however, uh, pines may be able to keep 12 growth increments alive. Uh, so on a pine, you might be able to transport directly uh, up and down the tree uh, over 12 growth increments. However, for hardwoods, you're really just going to see it on the outermost one or two uh, rings. So this is, it's kind of a, a, a unique to the hardwood. So if you think about uh, the vascular system of the tree, it can never really do without a vascular system. That's like us, we, we, we couldn't say, okay, let's, uh, let's shut down this year's vascular system and then magically start up next year's and just start working on next year's vascular system. So what has to happen is um, the trees working on one year's vascular tissue while it grows the next year's. This happens in the spring. And so sometime in the spring, it's going to jump from last year's uh, uh, xylem tissue to the current year's xylem tissue. And so for a little while, you are going to have two rings uh, 
two growth increments conducting water, but after that shift happens, it's just going to be one. However, there are a few species that can maintain two years, uh, and elm might be a good example. Uh, this, this might be a good place to point out that the ISA exam itself is really based on northern hemisphere hardwood forests. Uh, so you're not going to, uh, you know, if you're somewhere else in the country, uh, some of these things are going to be obvious to you and some of them not. If you're down in the southern hemisphere, we might not talk about any trees that you've ever heard of before. However, this is an international exam. So we try to get as much generic information in as we can uh, as it applies to the bulk of the forests in the world. Uh, however, uh, there will be specific things that are much different throughout the, throughout the world. So just keep that in mind as you study for this exam, sort of think globally uh, instead of thinking, you know, what's going to happen in the Piedmont region of Georgia or more specifically how do trees grow in Decatur because uh, Decatur tree, the way trees grow in Decatur, Georgia is going to be much different than the way trees grow or look uh, here in central Texas where I'm located. Uh, it's just geographically, it's different. The environs are different. It's going to produce a different uh, morphology as a result of that. Uh, so we've talked about the xylem tissue. Now remember the cambium produces two types of tissues. We're going to have xylem tissue to the inside and to the outside we're going to produce phloem tissue. This is the cool stuff. Uh, Phloem is what moves the photosynthate uh, to where it can be consumed. So this is going to move carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrate is another word for a sugar. Uh, and it's produced in the leaves. So everywhere that you see green in a tree, mostly the leaves, that's where photosynthesis is going to occur. Uh, you might see it on thin bark trees. You might see... Uh, photosynthesis occurring uh, on the bark of a crepe myrtle, for instance. Uh, you know, as it flakes off or ex exfoliates some of the older bark, you'll see the, the green underneath, and that, uh, that green can produce photosynthates. So once that photosynthate is produced, it needs to be relocated. It needs to go to somewhere where there's a demand for it. Uh, so movement of these photosynthates are relatively slow. They occur along pressure gradients. Most photosynthate moves inward and downward. So photosynthate is generated out in the canopy. It's moved down into the twigs, down into the uh, branches, down into the leaders, down into the trunk, down into the roots. Uh, all along the way, there's parts of the tree that says, hey, I can't produce any photosynthate, but you need me to stay alive. Uh, so I need some of those. And so it's going to move uh, out of the flow of tissue and out to the cells where it's needed. So we say that uh, the movement inside of flow of vessels can go in both directions uh, through these things, these sieve cells, uh, sieve tube elements. Uh, surrounded by these little companion cells that help uh, add a little bit of structure and can make decisions like, hey, I need to pull some starches out and use them somewhere else. Uh, but this upward and outward movement is very localized. The University of Georgia did some, study, some studies on extreme um, photosynthate usage and movement in plants. And the only way that they can really get photosynthates to move out towards a branch tip is just hours before the plant died. So in general, it's not going to move outward. It has the capability to move. Uh, if you think about a twig, uh, I might be able to move um, photosynthates a few millimeters up and out to be used, but uh, its outward movement is nowhere near the mass movement of inward and downward. And we'll see where that's super important to understand uh, when we talk about the storage of starches and pruning and how those relate to each other. Uh, you know, here's some examples of xylem cells. 
Here are these uh, tracheids that wrap themselves around the vessels. Uh, tracheids, in this situation, these are going to be used to hold up these xylem cells, add some rigidity to it. Uh, notice that the mass flow here in xylem is always up. So it's going to suck it in from the root system, push it up through the trunk and out to the leaves to be used in the process of photosynthesis. Phloem cells, uh, by and large, move downwards. So you can think about it as it flows down. Uh, it's a good, good way to uh, you know, help you remember which is which. Uh, there is a two-way flow, but remember it's fairly uh, small movement in the upward direction. So uh, phloems, the old non-functioning phloem, this is, remember, phloems getting produced to the outside of the cambium. So as these cells age, something has to happen to them. Remember, as these cells age, as xylem tissue ages, it stays in place and becomes part of the permanent tree. Phloem tissue is not necessarily the case. It gets crushed into the cortex, the phelloderm, and the cork cambium. Uh, where it is used to produce these other cells. Uh, it becomes old, non-functioning, uh, but still, I mean, old, uh, still has a function, but its function is uh, much different. It's not, its function is no longer for conducting things. So we talked a lot about the movement of inside of that sapwood area. So not just up and down, but we have to store all these extra starches. Trees produce about 66% more photosynthate than they can use, barring all other problems. Uh, so a normal, healthy tree without infections and full canopy out in the open sun is going to produce a lot of photosynthate, and it's going to get stored away in, these, uh, in this sapwood. The tree has to have a mechanism to get it out to be consumed when it needs it, such as um, you know, caterpillars come through and defoliate the canopy. Well, all of a sudden, the tree needs a lot of energy to uh, activate those secondary buds to push a whole new canopy out. That takes a lot of energy. Uh, and so that, that energy is gathered up uh, along these ray cells. So the stored energy that's out here in the area marked A, you know, this is... Uh, this storage area, the ray cells are going to take it and it's going to move it out to the active uh, phloem uh, where it can be moved uh, to where it's needed. Uh, again, that might be upwards a little bit or downwards a lot, but these, re these ray cells are what moves uh, energy laterally. Uh, this is the radial movement uh, or longitudinal axial and radial. Uh, so it's going to move it this direction. Uh, they also can move other compounds. We talk a lot about photosynthates being carbohydrates, uh, but we'll also see that carbohydrate uh, that uh, photosynthesis produces a plethora, a full pharmacy of chemical compounds. These also can be stored in the sapwood and used when needed. So. Carbohydrate, when it says carbohydrates and other compounds, other compounds um, are, are what we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, and again, they can, ray cells can also take the extra abundance of carbohydrates produced out here. It can move them in for storage. Uh, it can also assist in the restricting decay. Uh, these ray cells are, perform a very important role in the coated model. And we'll see how, uh, how they are affect the coded model a little bit later. Uh, so they are alive. They, uh, it's an active part of the vascular system. Then we move out to the bark, the outer covering of a tree's branches, stems, and even sometimes the roots uh, have this protective layer. Uh, it is sort of non-functioning phloem. Remember, as that phloem dies, it gets crushed in against the backside of the bark, and then the bark gets pushed out a little bit. So if you've gone and pulled a, a big plate of bark off of a pine, you'll notice that it's in layers. 
uh, and those layers are sort of an exaggerated view. That's what you're looking at. It's the old phloem tissue that keeps getting pushed to the outside as new phloem tissue is made uh, along the cambium. Uh, so uh, the amount of corky, corky material varies by tree species. So the, you've all pulled sort of the cork out of a, a wine bottle, I'm sure, and you've seen a real cork, not the synthetic ones, but the real ones. Uh, that comes from this part of the bark of a tree. There is a Spanish oak uh, cork bark um, that produces super thick cork. And so they harvest this, this cork without doing damage to the tree. Uh, the trees will continue to produce it. Remember, it's non-living, so it's not really hurting the trees to harvest it. Um, bark also helps to minimize water loss. It helps to regulate the temperature uh, on bright sunny days instead of the uh, vascular tissue reaching those very high temperatures, uh, continually absorbing heat, sort of like if you think about uh, asphalt. So even though it might be 90 degrees outside, the asphalt could be... Uh, approaching 160, 170 degrees. Well, inside of a tree, the outside of the bark can be very hot as it absorbs heat throughout the day, but it it's acts as an insulator so that that heat doesn't get moved uh, close to the living tissue. So again, uh, it's going to be a, a covering, so you're going to minimize water loss. It's a thick covering to moderate the temperatures. Uh, and it will provide some defense as beetles and birds try to penetrate it to get at that photosynthate. That photosynthate can be used by all kinds of animals. Think uh, humans can use it directly uh, in, in maple syrup. We, we, we harvest that, uh, that flow, of that, what comes from the flow, of, we boil it all down, we make uh, maple syrup out of it. So it's very rich in carbohydrates. There's all sorts of things that like to feed on those carbohydrates. We have uh, molds and fungi and insects and you, you name it, everything wants a free lunch. Uh, so the bark helps to add some protection to keep things from getting at that, at that part of the tree. Uh, so next we'll go out on a, onto a stem and we'll try to find these lenticels. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, I said it's like a whole pharmacy. It's a chemical company. So this tree wants to produce all these chemical compounds and anyone that's taken chemistry, remember it from high school or college, you, you know that you mix things together and you produce a certain reaction to wind up with a specific compound. Uh, there might be some things abundant in greater amounts, and so the process of combination might liberate a gas or might require a gas as part of the process. So these lenticels are what open and close to allow uh, these gases in or out so that the pressure uh, remains fairly normal inside of the tree. So it's permeable gas exchange. Uh, if you've ever gone out and seen a... Uh, a cherry tree outside, you can almost see these lenticels from a distance. It becomes um, identifiable. It's like you can see it so far away, you say, oh, wow, it must be a stone fruit. It must be a cherry. Uh, so, uh, you know, here we, we can see these small little specks on the surface. Uh, and these All these little specks are lenticels. So, one of the smaller parts of uh, that bears the leaves of the tree, the scaffolding system would be the stem. Uh, twigs would be small stems that provide support for the leaves, branches support for the twigs and trunk supports for the branches. So, uh, and the twigs, so you can see there's kind of a hierarchy of, of organ there uh, that forms the structure of the tree. Here we have a little close-up of the anatomy. We talked about this terminal bud out here already. Uh, we can also think about this as the apical meristem. Uh, if this were, uh, it's also, if this is as far as it gets in a year, this becomes the terminal bud. So that's, uh, that's the last thing it did before it went into dormancy was kind of form this bud. Uh, throughout the growing, this, this would be the location of the previous year's terminal bud. So in the springtime, it elongated out to here, 
started forming a terminal bud. It produced lenticels on its way out as it extended. It produced uh, leaf buds and a flower bud. And there's even secondary uh, buds behind these. So uh, as it did this, remember this is the apical uh, meristem. It's the terminal, it's also the terminal bud in this case. Uh, lateral or uh, uh, buds are out here to the to, to the side, so they are produced. So if it's not a terminal bud, it's an axial bud or a lateral bud along the stem. Trees have a lot of redundancy. Earlier, I talked about what happens if the canopy is lost and it has to need it needs a lot more energy to produce another canopy. Well, the tree knows that the original canopy might get eaten off or burned off or damaged in a hailstorm, and so it has this backup system, this sort of secondary bud that remains dormant, and that bud can remain dormant for decades. Uh, we'll see what happens to those when they're stimulated later, but um, if it's never, you know, so again, it can remain dormant. The primary bud is what's going to produce the leaf. Uh, right behind it, it might produce a flower for reproduction. The distance from the previous year's terminal bud to this year's terminal bud is uh, the nodal distance, the internodal distance. So this area between is called the internode. The actual scar here is the node. So from node to node, uh, the distance between that's the internode. And you can tell a lot about a tree's health by the amount that it grows for a year, from year to year. So this uh, internodal distances in good, uh, good rainfall years and good sunlight years, uh, as an example, could be 10 or 12 inches. In droughty years, this internodal distance could be two or three inches. And so you can tell a lot about the tree's history by looking at internodal uh, distances. We talked about those, those secondary buds, those dormant buds that remain there for a long time. Uh, at some point, the tree might need to call on those, and we refer to those as adventitious buds. These are produced along the stems or even on roots uh, when the primary meristem uh, is not normally found. Uh, development may be stimulated by the loss of normal buds and the growth regulators they produce. Apical meristems out there at the very tip produce uh, hormones that inhibit or limit the growth of the rest of the branch. So if you remove that branch tip by pruning or storm damage or deer feeding on it or something like, like that, that hormone will be absent. And when that hormone is absent, it will stimulate the development of these adventitious buds. Other things that can do it might be sunlight, uh, a decline in, in, uh, in canopy uh, production of photosynthates can also stimulate uh, this, this growth. Another word that we use for this is epicormic. So epicormic shoots result when dormant buds elongate. So you can say adventitious growth or epicormic growth. Branches are autonomous. Wow, that sounds kind of funky, doesn't it? So if you think about a tree, they uh, since that energy moves inward and downward, that means that that branch has to produce all of the energy that it needs in order to stay alive. So it needs to produce all of its own defense chemicals. It needs to produce all of its own photosynthate and all of that. And then if the branch has some le left over, it's going to pass it down the, down the trunk or down the leader. So we need to be able to think that these things are autonomous. So our branch literally operates on its own accord uh, without influence of the rest of the tree. Uh, uh, they are, branches are also strongly attached to wood uh, and bark uh, below the branch, but weakly attached above. And we'll see how this forms. Later, so here's some branch morphology. Remember, morphology is the form that things take. Uh, layers of tissue produced annually at the junction of where a branch comes into contact with a tree uh, will produce uh, uh, sort of a shoulder. Uh, this example that, that we see is what we refer to as codominance. Um, 
this is a line, if we follow this line all the way down to about here somewhere, this is actually where this side shoot decided that it was going to be uh, just as in charge as the primary. So this is, uh, there's no branch collar evident here. There's no, there's that shoulder doesn't exist. Uh, so we'll look at this, but this is what we refer to as included bark. So that's what this picture is trying to show. And before these weeks are over, you're going to know more about included bark than you, you ever wanted to, I'm sure. Uh, but let's look a little closer at uh, those tissues that overlap and what they mean and how they appear on the tree. This is especially useful when it comes to pruning. Uh, we'll talk a lot about pruning in the pruning section, but today from a biological perspective, we want to know what's happening right here. So this part is called the branch bark ridge. And this is where those two, um, you know, and remember that you have tissue growing outward uh, to, to the branch and upwards in your in your trunk. So you have trunk tissue and limb tissue that come together. Uh, as that happens over time, you, you develop this branch bark ridge. If you were to follow this inward uh, into the tree, this would be the point at which the branch uh, initially came off the side. So I'm going to try something here and see if it uh, see if it works for me it might not work but we'll give it a shot so if we follow this uh, all the way down to here the branch bark ridge and then draw a line up from that point and down from that point um, this is all of the secondary growth that occurred since this branch came off of the trunk. So if we went back in time to this area, uh, we would have, uh, that would be the size of the trunk when this was just a little sprout on the side of the tree. So every year those two came together, back to my laser pointer, those two came together and crushing that tissue, uh, sort of erupting it upwards uh, and you get this ridge. Now, this is where the, they have to coexist. So there is some branch tissue in this uh, swollen area, and there's some uh, limb tissue in this swollen area. You go to the outside of the swollen area, and this is just limb tissue. You come to the inside of it, and this is just trunk tissue. So every year, remember that there's secondary growth. There's lateral development. In other words, that twig that was this big around becomes bigger and bigger around uh, every year as secondary growth is added. So we have to go, again, remember this is almost like a timeline. This branch bark ridge is a timeline in formation. So if we think about how this branch is attached, I'm going to try this again. Uh, Here's the branch, uh, sort of come down like this and come down like this. So if we think about this branch inside of the tree, it's going to form a little pocket, uh, a little cone that goes down towards this, this trunk. So if we were to make a pruning cut, as the example shows, uh, on the on the right, if we make the proper cut, the only tissue we're going to damage is going to be limb tissue. If we cut here, you can see how we're going to cross over trunk tissue, get into limb tissue, back to trunk tissue on the side. So we're going to be damaging multiple types of uh, tissue by uh, making the wrong pruning cut. Uh, this area that's right through here is what's called the branch protection zone. Uh, from a chemical standpoint, there's lots of protective chemicals that are produced right here that we'll talk about a little later. Uh, leaves, these are where um, the energy is produced. This is where photosynthates are made. This is where all the chemical stuff happens. Uh, leaves have cells with chloroplasts. Those are the, the green cells that contain the chlorophyll 
or the green pigment. Uh, chlorophyll is the primary leaf pigment that absorbs sunlight. The energy of the sunlight is collected in the chloroplasts. The light energy converts uh, to chemical energy, forming carbohydrates in a reaction called photosynthesis. Leaves are also where transpiration occurs. Transpiration, uh, this is how uh, water gets out of the tree. The tree has to constantly absorb water to go out and collect all of the dissolved elements in the soil. So you could think about, uh, uh, it's in the wrong direction, but if you think about uh, flushing your, your toilet, whatever waste is in the toilet, the water is the carrier and it carries it out to uh, the processing plant uh, where the water is separated from the refuse and the refuse is cleaned up and taken away and the water was just a carrier so there is a lot of moisture that's required a lot of water required to collect enough dissolved elements to move it up into the tree for photosynthesis so there's a lot of leftover uh, and it wants to keep that process going and that process is transpiration uh, transpiration is the loss of water vapor from the leaves. Not only does this help cool the leaves and cool the canopy, but it draws water up through the xylem. So you can think about it as a negative pressure that's applied to a long straw. So you're, 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 you're sucking your drink up through the top of the straw. It's pulling it up from the bottom and you're standing it in a column. So normally when you're not uh, sucking on the straw, the uh, liquid level inside of the straw drops down to whatever the liquid level is in the glass. Um, what transpiration does is it maintains that pressure so that you have a standing column of water that's uh, higher than what atmospheric pressure would suggest is possible. Um, so leaf blades provide a very large surface area for sunlight absorption. Uh, they orient themselves towards the sun. The, the leaf is all about collecting sun and getting rid of moisture. Leaves are thin so that uh, it has lots of surface area compared to its inner volume. Uh, no cell inside of a leaf is very far from the surface. You know, if you've ever noticed, you can see through uh, a lot of leaves. It's just how thin they are. The, the cells are all just right there. The outer surface of a leaf is covered by a waxy layer called the cuticle. That's that part that's right on the, the upper surface usually. Uh, if you think about uh, a, a holly or a magnolia, these can have a very thick cuticle, a very thick covering to the outside. Uh, something that might have a very thin cuticle would be a dogwood uh, or an understory tree might have a very thin cuticle. The cuticle minimizes the amount of desiccation, which is the water loss through the leaf. Small openings on the leaves called stomata, these are found on the bottom, control the loss of water vapor and gas exchange with the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is absorbed in through the leaf and water vapor is released from the leaf. Uh, leaves can also give off oxygen. Uh, guard cells, these are located adjacent to the stomates. Uh, they regulate the opening and closing of the stomata in response to light, tissue, humidity, and that sort of thing. Leaves have a network of conducting tissue. Remember, we, the tree still has this xylem tissue and uh, the phloem tissue inside of a leaf, however, because the leaf uh, in a deciduous tree is going to be dropped, so there's no sense in accumulating xylem year to year. So um, we use what's called a vascular bundle. So it's the sort of where uh, it's sort of like what we have as, as veins and arteries. Um, arteries taking oxygenated or enriched blood out to where it's needed and veins pulling it uh, out. So um, this is similar to how a vascular bundle is going to look. So we'll see it a little closer here. Uh, so here are the, the stomates uh, and then the guard cells to the either side of the stomate. So the darker cells are the stomates, the lighter cells just to the outside of it, these little C-shaped things. These are the guard cells that control the opening. Uh, here's an example of the vascular bundle. So it does sort of look like a, an artery, but it's, uh, it's a way to get uh, the nutrients into the leaf and the produced photosynthates out of the leaf. 
Uh, here we have the, this sort of spongy airspace. Remember, there's lots of chemical reactions going on in here. So it, it's meeting uh, a supply of carbon dioxide. It's liberating oxygen. Uh, without these spongy layers, uh, the, the, leaf, the leaves would just blow up. So it has to have a way to uh, uh, maintain those, uh, those gases uh, in, a, in a neutral, uh, in a pressure neutral kind of way. Uh, and then the stomates help to get new in and push new old, push the old out. So uh, again, leaf root retention, this might be kind of obvious, but uh, the, when the leaves fall off of the tree, this is referred to as deciduous. Uh, if they hold on to leaves more than a year at a time, they are referred to as evergreen. Uh, here in Central Texas, we have lots of live oaks and our live oaks always have some leaves on them. Uh, so they are referred to as evergreen. However, you might have, even within the oak family, you might have red oaks or white oaks whose leaves will totally drop off and those will become deciduous. Uh, so even the same uh, uh, oaks can be both deciduous and evergreen depending on the exact species. Leaves do uh, eventually fall off after they've been used up. Uh, they become more and more inefficient. You remember because they have those vascular bundles, so they really can't get bigger and bigger every year. Whatever size they are when they're produced, that's the size they're going to be. So hail damage, pollution damage, light damage, uh, insect damage, all that eventually erodes the leaf away to the point where it needs to get rid of it. Or if it's a deciduous tree, uh, you know it's going to drop them all. And that drop happens uh, at the abscission zone. If you remember back to that, uh, that anatomy of a twig on there, there was also a little, uh, what they called a, a leaf scar. When the leaf falls off, it leaves a, a scar behind. Uh, you'll find out a little more about the, the scars and what those scars mean when we look at tree identification later. Uh, but that area is the abscission zone. Uh, and because it's a particular zone where the leaf falls off, that's how the tree protects itself from losing photosynthate out of, a, out of an open wound. It's, it's closed by the time it actually falls off. Uh, you know, as the leaf is breaking down for the fall, this is where our fall colors come from. Uh, so as the compounds that are needed to produce green, the uh, chloroplasts, as that's, it, the tree doesn't really want to waste it all, so it wants to break it down into its component, its chemical component parts, pull it out uh, to where it can be used for the next year. Uh, as it does that, you get the, the color change in the leaf. Uh, that can be influenced greatly by short, sunny days and cold nights, which can enhance the accumulation of sugars and it will trigger a decrease in chlorophyll production, and then you begin to have these color changes. So the, the, the short uh, sunny days and cold nights, um, if it happens gradually, you'll have a very beautiful fall if you had enough uh, rainfall during the year. Here's a, a little more information on uh, leaf color change, what produces those and how it happens. Uh, now let's talk about roots. Roots grow, roots are opportunistic. Roots grow where there's moisture and oxygen. If there's more, if either one of those are a limiting factor, root growth stops. Uh, a root cannot say, hey, there's a lake way over there on the other side of the pasture. I'm going to grow one root way over there and stick my end down in the lake and I'm going to have all the water I ever need. This is awesome. They can't do that. Uh, roots grow everywhere where it's possible and thrive where it's the best. Um, root systems have four primary functions. Anchorage, it's going to hold the tree to the soil. Absorption, it's going to gather nutrients out of the soil. Storage, it's going to store the, all that leftover photosynthate uh, in the secondary, secondary tissue. And fourth, conduction. I'm going to conduct that absorbed material into the xylem tissue and push it up into the canopy. So there are main roots. These are large woody roots that anchor, store, and conduct. Now similar to leaves up in the canopy that are sacrificial, 
something uh, similar happens in the root system, and these are absorbing roots. They are small, fibrous, primary tissue that grows at the end and along the, the main woody roots. Uh, some of these can, uh, can grow and die several times over the course of a year. Absorbing roots have epidermal cells that may be modified into root hairs. Uh, root hairs aid in the uptake of water and minerals. Remember, the flatter something is, the closer the cells are to the surface. That means you have an increase in absorptive capabilities. So if I produce a very long cell out into the soil, uh, that cell is going to be relatively small. Everything's going to be close to the surface. It's going to be good at uptake. Root tips contain a meristematic zone, just like we saw out on the branch tip. This is, uh, this is where the cells divide and elongate, as we saw in the earlier micrograph. Uh, most absorbing roots are found in the upper 12 inches of the soil. Um, that's because that's where the air and water is. Uh, it just doesn't perk much deeper than that. Uh, and again, this is uh, an international exam. So different parts of the world will have different, uh, different depths of the roots, even with the same species of tree. Uh, and we'll, you'll learn a little more about why when we get to soils, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, there are lateral roots and some trees produce sinker roots. This example is what we primarily would see in the Piedmont region of Georgia. However, if you go down to Australia, uh, where they have a different soil type and different water tables, you might see these sinker roots. Uh, pine trees here, uh, not in central Texas, we don't have pines here, but in east Texas, where the piney, piney woods start, and the piney woods go all the way from Texas all the way over to Georgia. So uh, these can have some sandy attributes to the soil and you can see some much deeper roots on some of these pines in those sandy soils. Uh, now we started talking about a taproot at the very beginning and the taproot is a downward growing root. It is typically thought of as uh, a juvenile organ. If you think about an acorn, when it first cracks open and it pushes a, a little thing out to the end, the thing it pushes out is going to become the root. The other end, it pushes up and that's going to become uh, the seed leaves. That first little downward movement, that is the taproot. It's going to tap into the soil and it wants to find a certain depth where all of the other roots will be able to grow. So tap roots grow downward until they hit about an 8% oxygen level in the soil. Remember, the closer to the surface of the soil you are, the higher the oxygen content is going to be. Roots actually like uh, about 10% oxygen in the soil. So roots are not going to thrive at 8%. They might be able to live at 8%, but they're really not going to thrive. So once it hits this depth, that apical meristem of that taproot is going to die. And remember that apical meristem was producing a chemical that limited the growth of everything else behind it. So once that tip dies, then you're all of a sudden you're going to get these other roots that shoot off of that original taproot. And that's going to form uh, the permanent root system. Some trees are thought to have uh, tap roots that exist for uh, a very long period of time. And again, this is soil dependent. In the Piedmont region of Georgia, just as an example, 98% of the root system is going to be found in the top 18 inches of the soil. 90% of those roots are going to be found in the top four. Uh, so tap roots just don't exist there. Uh, you might occasionally find an 8% oxygen gradient at uh, four or five feet below the soil surface but you, uh, that's about it. Uh, you know, when I was in elementary school, we used to study this picture and it was a tree that grew up like this above ground and a root system that went like this below ground, uh, sort of a mirror image. And that's, that's not reality. Uh, they just cannot grow that deep. So where the root system comes up out of the soil uh, and uh, forms the trunk. So we're going from the soil up to the trunk. Uh, this is the root 
crowned, the area where the roots join the stem. Roots spread out from the crown and decrease quickly in diameter. So this large root is what we refer to as a first order primary root. Uh, its structural responsibility is to bear the compressive weight of the tree onto the soil. Remember I said wood is weak in compression, so it has to grow a lot more tissue to support weight uh, than it does uh, for tension weight. So right at the very base of the tree, uh, this is where it grows uh, these very large diameter roots. And on a big mature tree, these roots might stay fairly large diameter out away from the trunk, six or seven feet, maybe even up to 12 feet. Uh, and then they, they go from being large diameter roots to small diameter roots uh, over a very short uh, period. Uh, this, this, where it shrinks down, this is referred to as the zone of rapid taper. Uh, those roots can then run the height one to two inches or one to two times the height of the tree or even more in all directions, but they're going to be about as big around as a silver dollar or less. Uh, so one to two inches in diameter. So as the tree blows this way, here's the, here's those, those bottom roots. As the tree blows this way, it's going to compress on this side and on the back side, it's going to pull. So those long roots become tension roots. So these are the, the tension and compression roots. Uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, we'll talk a little more about construction damage and how all of these functions relate to, to, uh, uh, to construction and to uh, tree conservation and to uh, risk assessments a little later. Roots may extend laterally for long distances, depending on the, the, the tree and the soil conditions. For trees grown in the open, roots can extend two to three times the radius of the crown. Uh, roots extend and in direction is, uh, is a function of the environment rather than its genetics. Uh, if you have uh, a wide open field, the root system can be tremendous in size. If you have compacted soils, you have like a city street, uh, you might have compacted soils, uh, low light levels and things like that. And the root system might not grow very much at all because those, uh, those root tips that try to go out and exploit the soil that go out and try to find new areas to harvest uh, water from might not be very successful, so the root system could be very small. Now there's uh, a relationship that trees have, that tree roots have with a fungus. Uh, and this, this has been going on from an evolutionary standpoint since the very beginning of trees themselves. In fact, uh, these fungi were uh, the original root systems to trees. So you could think that the, the fungi that's responsible for this, for this relationship pre-existed the root. So that's how old this relationship is. Uh, that the tree actually developed genetically a root system in conjunction with uh, this, this, uh, this fungus that grew on the tree. So this relationship between those two, this is symbiotic, meaning they both gain some kind of benefit. The tree gains a benefit. The fungus gets a benefit from the association. Uh, fungi de derive some photosynthate out of the root system, uh, but the fungi itself aids in uh, the absorption of water and essential minerals from the soil. Uh, they can, they're, they're many times larger and more efficient than a root hair. Uh, an example, one of the primary things that a tree needs is phosphate. Phosphate occurs in a molecule, and that molecule is very large. And it's so large, in fact, that it can't really pass through the cellular membrane of a root hair. But it can easily pass through the cellular membrane of uh, a mycorrhizal um, structure. Here's an example under a microscope, and these are about the same amount of magnification. Uh, these little clear things, remember, is, this is a root hair, 
it's coming off of uh, the root. So one cell, one hair. Over here, this is uh, what's called an ectomycorrhizal uh, structure. This is the colony of fungi that's growing on the root system. From these little antler looking things, you'll see the long stringy white uh, mycelial growth. Uh, mycelium. So if you've ever out in the woods and you pull back that, uh, that leaf litter at the very top, you might see this white stringy stuff. If you could follow it all the way back to something, you'd follow it back to one of these organisms. And so you can see how uh, much more efficient in absorbing moisture and, and nutrients and minerals are uh, for the mycorrhizae than the actual root. One of the things to take note of is that that white mycelial growth, it doesn't care what species of tree it's attached to. So they can actually uh, graft together and can share, uh, share resources across that, uh, across a mycorrhizal uh, relationship. Uh, so from tree physiology, this is photosynthesis putting together with light. That's the process by which green plants used to produce molecules of carbohydrates. The raw materials needed are carbon dioxide and water. Uh, carbohydrates are you know, the chemical energy used for growth and development. Oxygen is released through uh, the stomata as a product, byproduct of photosynthesis. Uh, here's sort of an oversimplified uh, look at it. So we have uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide that's available uh, through those stomates. We have sun that's coming in. Uh, we're producing glucose, uh, the chlorophyll. We're also producing all kinds of other stuff, but one of the things is glucose. Uh, we're bringing in the dissolved minerals and elements out of the soil, pushing them up into the tree to be used in this process to produce glucose. Uh, the process of using it is going to, I mean, of creating it is going to produce oxygen. Uh, again, these are the carbohydrates that are produced during photosynthesis, the building blocks for many other compounds that are required by the plant, phenols, and some of the other protective stuff out there. Um, so they can also produce uh, amino acids, fats, starches, proteins. Uh, so uh, this is how uh, uh, you know, vegans can, can survive because there's still all of these things can be produced inside of plants. Uh, then you don't have to have these from animals in our own diet. Respiration. Now, we've been talking about the production of energy and its storage. However, at some point, you have to use that energy for something. So when you burn that stored energy, this is respiration. It's the process by which carbohydrates stored as a starch are used. Carbohydrates are chains of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, that are chemically bound together. When these bonds are broken, energy is released and carbon dioxide and water are given off. Does that sound kind of familiar? That's what we do as humans. So when we eat food and we, we produce uh, uh, energy in our cells, our cells need to stay alive so they consume some of those energy. The, the the uh, glucose is broken down, uh, and as it's broken down and consumed, we liberate carbon dioxide. We breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, we breathe in oxygen to use for the process, but breathe out carbon dioxide. And so that's the same thing, respiration across all living things. Uh, so the uh, so trees use released energy for all biological functions. In other words, you have to in order to make money, you have to spend money. Respiration is a constant process. Uh, you know, a deciduous tree in the middle of the winter is not dead. But it's still alive, uh, meaning that it's consuming energy and it is respiring. Uh, it's important that photosynthesis exceeds respiration. So you want to make sure that you have more stored energy uh, than you are consuming. Otherwise, you're, you'll run out. When respiration takes place in the absence of photosynthesis, the tree must rely on stored energy reserves uh, in order to stay alive. Over a long period of time, this use of stored energy reserves causes the tree to run out of energy and die. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, oxygen is required for normal aerobic respiration. 
trees cannot respire in an anaerobic environment. Uh, you know, so where would this happen for a tree? Uh, an anaerobic environment. Remember, this, the roots need air. They need oxygen to stay alive because uh, the roots are constantly respiring. They don't produce energy. They're constantly consuming energy to, to absorb stuff. Uh, so if all of the airspace in the soil is filled up with water, say in, when it floods, then there's no, uh, there's no respiration going on. It can't respire. Uh, so it suffocates. Uh, this also is what happens under severe soil compaction conditions, uh, like on a construction site or bare soil where people walk a lot. Uh, when oxygen is scarce, re respiration uses food at a much higher than normal rate. So as the tree begins to suffocate, it begins burning energy almost at an uncontrolled rate. Uh, in the end, it burns up all the energy and uh, root death can result. Uh, it can grow new ones uh, if all the conditions are right. So let's talk about transpiration a little bit. Uh, transpirational water loss in the form of water vapor is also affected by cuticle thickness, the presence of hairs on the leaf. Remember, this is uh, sucking water up the xylem tissue. Uh, Hot, dry conditions might result in a thick cuticle, small leaves, and sunken stomata. Stomachs usually open during the day and close at night. You can stop this transpirational process by the use of, an, of a, a mechanically applied antitranspirant. Uh, this is usually some type of wax that you can spray on the underside of the leaf that, that plug all of the temporarily plug the, uh, the stomates, which will reduce in, uh, in water loss. This is this might be used uh, when you're transporting trees over a long distance and you're trying to preserve them uh, after you dig them and you're going to replant them somewhere else. Uh, they can reduce evaporative cooling, uptake of carbon dioxide and photosynthesis, so it just kind of slows the process down. Hey Rob, can I interrupt? I have one question. Uh, sorry, uh, I looks like I missed it, but uh, this is from Chris Gerards. Uh, he wanted to know if during the carnivorous period, decay fungi are absent. How can we assume the mycorrhizae to be present during this time? And can you say it one more time? Yeah, if during the carnivorous period, if decay fungi were absent, how can we assume the mycorrhiza to be present during this time? Uh, so this is, it's fairly recent um, studies that, it, that have come out about how root systems developed. Um, fungi from, uh, from an evolutionary standpoint uh, existed uh, long before uh, plants and animals did. Uh, so these, the, the, the fungi actually produce the base. So the, the mycorrhizal fungi predate by, by uh, hundreds of thousands of years tree tissue. Is that, is that what he's getting at? I believe so. Um, Chris, let me know if we didn't answer your question. Um, and everybody, please remember to put it in the Q&A. I may miss it if you put it in the chat, okay? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rob. Sure. Uh, so water is essential for all living cells. It's, uh, it's necessary for photosynthesis. It maintains cell turgidity. So if you, you've seen a plant that doesn't get watered, like maybe one of these behind me, you can see these leaves are starting to wilt a little bit. That's a loss of turgidity, so there's not quite enough uh, moisture in those leaves. Um, water is also necessary to dissolve the elements into so that it can be conducted in the xylem tissue. Um, uh, water is absorbed with mineral elements from the soil by the roots, and it's used for growth and metabolism. Most water is lost through transpiration, again, back to that sort of uh, you know, how a toilet might work, uh, where you have to use lots of water to carry away the refuse, but then the water is extracted from that uh, and reused. So the water was just a carrier. So that's why most water is lost through the transpirational process, because it's just a carrier for the minerals and elements. Water loss as it exits the leaf. This is that negative pressure I was talking about, sucking on the straw that maintains that column of moisture that's referred to as transpirational pull. Uh, this is this is the most current theory, and this is, is what uh, you'll go with on your exam uh, on how transpirational pull maintains that, that column of water. Xylem is a continuous column of water. 
so if it were to break, uh, presumably the level inside would drop back down to whatever atmospheric pressure would allow. Uh, water enters young roots or mycorrhizal roots by a process called osmosis. Uh, this means movement across a membrane. Um, pure water has the highest potential. Water with minerals or sugars uh, have a lower water potential. So this is sort of a funky thing to think about, but if on the inside of the plant it has very few dissolved uh, minerals, and on the outside in the soil there's lots of dissolved minerals, it wants to reach equilibrium. Uh, nature wants to be in equilibrium. So it wants to move things across that cellular membrane so that the quantities are the same on both sides. So when it's talking about this potential, it's the move, the potential to move from one side to, to the other. So if you have a plant that's very, uh, that has a ton of moisture in it and stuff like that, then on the, in the soil conditions, you have droughty soil conditions. You can actually have movement from the plant back into the soil. So it can move both ways across that membrane. And that's what this is getting at. Source and sink. Leaves are the source in a tree. Everything else is a sink. <laughs> if it's not manufacturing energy, remember energy is only manufactured through the process of photosynthesis, so chloroplast, so it has to be green. Uh, so it's going to go from whatever is green to whatever is not green. So whatever is not green but alive in a tree is called a sink. So the heartwood of a tree would not be considered the sink. It's not getting consumed there. But the sapwood, the, the roots, the branches, the leaves, anything that's not a leaf is going to be a sink and even a leaf to some point is a sink because it has to use energy itself. Uh, almost all plant parts at one time or another <coughs> excuse me, uh, are going to be a sink. Most photosynthate is utilized or stored <coughs> close to where it's made. <coughs> excuse me, I need to take a drink. All right, I'm uh, getting over a cold here, so hopefully my voice holds out for a while longer. <coughs> so here's an example of a source being the leaf. And again, the, the companion cell is going to pull out and help uh, the phloem to make the decision whether to use energy or contribute energy to the phloem uh, channels. Movement of water in the xylem and photosynthate in the phloem are examples of longitudinal or axial support. This means up and down. Radial transport in the horizontal movement of water and nutrients within the tree cells of different ages, uh, primarily through the ray cells that we saw earlier. The result of the interaction between the genetic potential and environmental conditions help to determine the size, the fall color, the forms that things take. Plant systems respond to environmental stimuli. Um, you know, we have light, uh, such as uh, the phototropic lean gravity, so that the tree knows uh, the roots grow down and the, the leaves grow up, and that uh, compressive forces are on the bottom side and tension forces are on the top side of the branch. Uh, temperatures, all these things have an influence on how trees grow and develop. The process in trees are controlled in part by plant growth regulators or plant hormones, naturally occurring compounds that act in very small quantities to regulate things like cell division, elongation, flowering, fruit ripening, leaf drop, dormancy, and root development. There are uh, a few basic hormones. There are more than these, but these are the ones that are found in most abundance. We have auxins, gibberellins, cytokinins, ethylene, and abscisic acid. Auxins are produced in uh, primarily in shoot tips, uh, also very important in root development. Uh, synthetic forms are sold to enhance rooting uh, of cuttings uh, and also as they can be used as herbicides. Uh, so if you can and stimulate a whole lot of growth, you're going to use up all the energy stored in a plant and you can kill it. That's how it's used as, a, as an insecticide. Um, 
oxidants can be used to stimulate uh, shoot growth uh, and root growth. It, has, it plays a part in atropism, the orientation or the direction of growth in response to external stimuli. So geotropism, this is the upward orientation of the stem growth and downward orientation of the root growth. Phototropism uh, is the growth towards sunlight. This is how trees are always growing towards uh, the source of energy. Cytokinins are produced in the roots and are instrumental in shoot initiation and growth. Auxins and cytokinins exist kind of in a, in a balance with each other. Uh, at different times of the year, one will be uh, more abundant than, than the other. Uh, this is where we get the, the, the spring growth and fall dormancy. Uh, growth regulators present in the terminal buds inhibit growth and development of lateral buds on the same shoot. So, so remember we talked about the adventitious growth or epicormic growth. Uh, apical dominance is controlled over those, uh, those actions by the hormone produced in that, uh, that meristem. Uh, strong dominance is confined primarily to the current season's shoot. Uh, after which lateral buds start growing. So if you think about uh, a long uh, top and then some side branches that are coming off, those side branches are a little more successful at doing their own thing uh, after the first year of growth. So this type of development over time leads to a form that a tree might take. If lateral shoots outgrow the original terminal shoot year after year, like we just talked about, you form what's called a decurrent tree, such as oaks and elms. Uh, however, some trees express strong apical dominance through most of their lives. These are referred to as excurrent trees, meaning they're going to grow much taller than they are wide over the course of their life. These would be sweet gums, yellow poplars, most conifers. All trees start off with X current properties. Uh, most trees, uh, they begin to round out as they mature. Uh, here we have an example of an X current tree with a very strong central leader. Here we have a decurrent tree that, you know, this, this branch is larger in diameter than this central leader is. So this is we start to get a, a much more rounded shape here over time. At maturity, most plants will develop some type of roundness to them. Uh, and if they're open grown, they might form source, some sort of roundness. So we see this pine that's growing out along a marsh somewhere. Uh, and it has a very full canopy. The canopy goes all the way to the, almost all the way to the ground. It's really rounded. It still has a pretty strong central leader, but you can see some scaffold branches inside that uh, of these that help that canopy to, to look a more rounded as it matured. Uh, you know, delicate and a changing balance of chemicals uh, produce signals that control the metabolic processes of photosynthesis, respiration, and all biological function. So there has to be, a, it's going to continue doing, a cell is going to continue doing whatever it is it's supposed to do until something tells it that it's not supposed to do it, or it's going to do basically nothing until another chemical says, hey, get to work. Uh, tree growth regulators impact each other and remain in this sort of di uh, dynamic equilibrium, meaning that, yeah, it reaches an equilibrium in theory, but one's always going to have a little more than, than the other. And so it's going to make something happen as a result. Uh, environmental stimuli, human stimuli can trigger changes such as pruning can be a major stimulator to uh, hormone changes in a, in a tree. So let's talk a little about mechanical defense systems before we get into the CODIT model. Uh, the defense mechanisms include uh, the thickness of the bark. Uh, the bark might have thorns. The leaves might have poisonous hairs or thick hairs or dense hairs. Uh, it might have a very thick cuticle, uh, cellular material uh, that might resist decay or ingestion by insects. Uh, so there might be some, some chemicals in the cells that uh, don't taste very good, that sort of thing. Uh, these would be uh, the production of chemicals that restrict feeding uh, or decay. So now let's jump to the, uh, the CODIT model. 
Again, this stands for compartmentalization of decay in trees. And this theory was first proposed by Dr. Alex Shigo, who spent most of his career actually going out and damaging trees and then going back and looking how the trees responded in a, using the scientific method, how trees responded to that decay. And what he found was that allows the tree to wall off a damaged area, which will limit the spread of discoloration of tissue and the spread of decay within the tissue. After, in, after injury, reactions are triggered that cause the tree to form boundaries around the wounded area. Uh, so injury can be a pruning cut. It can be compression damage uh, from someone kicking the tree or hitting it with a car or another tree falling onto uh, another tree. Uh, all of those things are wounds. Um, anytime a wound occurs, the tree responds to that wounding rather rapidly. In fact, it can start to respond within about 30 seconds of when the wound occurs, the tree will start to wall off the damage uh, the best that it can. There are four what we call walls. Remember, we're walling off damaged area. Uh, in trees, things happen in three dimensions. So you have up and down a stem or uh, in and out on a branch. Uh, and then there's the radial growth. So there's the secondary growth. So there's some, uh, there's some three-dimensional component to it. So we have to think about how the tree can wall off. Uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about the different parts, the anatomy of the, the vascular system and all that sort of thing. And this is what it boils down to. It boils down to how it can wall off or protect itself. Um, remember, trees do not have the ability to heal. Heal refers to cellular replacement. Uh, wounds close in a tree. We close, we wall off damage. It's not healed. There is no healing process that occurs in trees. So please, if you use the word heal in conjunction with trees, try to replace heal with close uh, because that's what really happens. It really gets walled off. Uh, so the very first reaction, so these are in order of response time, basically. Uh, wall one resists the vertical movement of decay organisms. So this is the up and down. So it's going to plug tissue above and it's going to plug vascular tissue below the wound uh, to keep it from going up or down. This is the weakest of the four walls. Wall two resists the inward spread. So remember that uh, we have these growth increments and there was that very clear boundary that we saw uh, between late wood and early wood. I remember that sort of line. It's the what we would count as the growth increment. That becomes the inner wall. That's wall two. So it's going to the the there's little cells all over that are called. There's an organelle inside of a cell. Uh, it's a cytocyst, and what it is is it's called a it's Latin for suicide sac. So it's it's a little thing that can explode inside of a cell and kill the cell. So when we wound a tree, the first thing the tree wants to do is organize itself into these into, in order to wall it off. So it's going to take control by killing the cells around the damaged area and filling them with, uh, with a chemical that will either, in wall one's case, <coughs> it's going to plug the vascular tissue. In wall two's case, it's going to, it's going to kill the tissue back to that previous growth increment. Uh, on the inside so that it can't get any deeper into the tree. Wall three resists the lateral spreads. Remember, if we thought about that cross section of wood, um, wall two is that the growth increment. The ray cells radiated from the middle out towards the active years flow them, if you recall. And that's, the, that's how you get that transport that goes, that radial transport that goes from the flow them into the sapwood or out from the sapwood to the flow. So those are going to form kind of a pie shape. So tissue is going to die back to one of those ray cells in both directions. And that's the, that's wall three. 
So walls one, two, and three uh, form the zone. Wall four is a physical boundary. So the outside where the wound actually happened at the perimeter of that wound, the tree is going to produce new wood. It's going to produce a tissue, a woody tissue uh, that we can call wound wood. Uh, and this wound wood is going to close over the damaged area over time. This one's not nearly as fast. It might start the process right away, depending on the time of the year. But walls one, two, and three, you know, wall one might happen in uh, the first 30 seconds. Wall two might happen in the first 20 seconds to, to 40 seconds. Wall three might happen in that same time period. So those are protection zones. Uh, wall four is a really a physical and it's the most strongest of all the, uh, the walls because it's new healthy tissue that's growing. So here's some examples of what, uh, what it looks like in real life now that we talked about it. So you can see that there was some sort of wound that happened to this thing. You see discoloration of tissue uh, above and below it. Uh, here you can see uh, where this is where wall four occurred. And this is all the growth that grew since wall four. So again, here's the boundary of the decay where it was compartmentalized, where it was walled off. The growth from that point outward uh, is what happened since it established wall four. The lateral spread, remember these go back to the uh, uh, it goes back to the ray cells. So these, this is the ray cells. Uh, so hopefully this helps you to envision it. Uh, and again, this is, here's the wound. Here's below the pruning cut or below the wound. So this would have been wall four right here, this dark line. And this is the tissue that it grew after it was injured. Over long periods of time, the, that fourth wall continues to grow. If the wound is very large, it might not ever close the wound. So there might not be closure there, uh, which would lead to uh, an enormous amount of decay on the inside. So the decay column can potentially become all the wood that existed at the time of the injury. And then all of the wood that's come about since that wall four was developed is the only sound wood the tree might have. So this is an example, uh, you know, where the uh, wall three totally failed and it, uh, the rot became everything that uh, happened before wall four was developed. So you get this hollow. Uh, when walls one, two, and three fail, they can spread uh, inside of the tree, and that's how those cavities are formed. The barrier zone, wall four, is chemically strong, uh, but uh, weak structurally because the structural role of the parenchyma rays uh, is discontinuous at wall four. So wall four is the strongest wall, but it's not really vascular tissue. So it doesn't really have the exact same properties as the original tissue that was there. Uh, so this wound wood is not exactly like good conductive tissue. The process that resists the spread of decay into new growth uh, can also lead to shakes. Uh, these are lengthwise separation between growth rings. Uh, and then you can also have cracks in the tissue. So if you look at this, uh, uh, this would be a crack. If the crack occurred right here, that would be a shake. Uh, so you can have shakes and cracks. Uh, so tropical trees, again, these are different. The anatomy varies uh, more than that of temperate species. Tropical trees may lack the annual growth learning like we already talked about because they don't really experience dormancy. Uh, another uh, typical property of a tropical tree is that they have extremely large foliage. Uh, the flowers tend to be very big, uh, or the fruit, think, think banana leaves and bananas. Uh, that's pretty large stuff, uh, you know, compared to a little small seed that a maple might make. 
Uh, some have very wide spreading buttress roots that are going to help support because uh, tropical soils tend to be uh, not very good because there's not a lot of organic matter that's getting back down to the soil. It's used up in the tree canopy itself. Uh, so the buttress roots are very large to help hold the trees up. Some also produce aerial roots. These are roots that hang down from branches um, and can form uh, new trees, but they're important in gas exchange. And once they hit the ground, they can actually become uh, mechanical support. Uh, and like I said, they can produce new trees. They can propagate. New plants propagated from, uh, from an aerial root is an exact clone of the parent tree, by the way. Uh, they are also identified from their rapid growth rates because of the favorable growing conditions. There's plenty of moisture, tons of sunlight, and constant throughout the growing season. Uh, they're very easy to transplant. Uh, wound closure is rapid after injury. However, if you remove one of these trees from its native ecology, uh, it's going to suffer and just, just won't survive very well. Now, palms, uh, this is sort of the last part before we wrap up tree biology. Uh, you know, palms are monocots. Uh, most trees are dicots, meaning they have two seed leaves. Uh, monocots have a single seed leaf. Uh, the most common monocot you probably experience is grass. So palms are much more like a grass than they are a tree. But because uh, palms are long lived and they're, they're large and self supporting and all that sort of stuff, we group them in with trees based uh, on their physical attributes and not because of their uh, uh, vascular anatomy. Palms do not have a cambium layer or growth rings of xylem. Remember, there's no secondary growth. They have vascular bundles of phloem and xylem uh, that are interspersed throughout the stem and sheathed in very strong fibers embedded in a matrix of parenchyma cells. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what the monocot stem would look like. Where everything is just sort of evenly based and all of these vascular bundles combined together are what forms the trunk. So there's no xylem. Uh, there's no accumulation of over time of xylem tissue. Um, the stems develop all the vascular bundles that it's ever going to need behind the primary bud as it grows. So uh, palm trees have these different stages. So if you've ever seen a very young palm, they stay just a few, few feet in, in height for years sometimes decades, depending on the, the species of palm. Uh, and when it's in this small stage, it's getting larger and larger in diameter until it has produced all the vascular bundles that it's going to need for the rest of its life. Uh, once it reaches that point, then it shoots up in height. And so if you see a palm, you'll sometimes you'll, you'll see them and as it goes up, they might get a little skinny or a little fatter and a little skinny or a little fatter. That's this vascular bundles are either swollen or shrunken depending on uh, sunlight, pruning, hurricane damage, uh, soil moisture and things like that. The, as it's produced, as the top grows up, it leaves the, the, new, the newly constructed ends of those vascular bundles behind. And so that's it's, its response. But the width at which it is when it first came out of the ground, that's its maximum width. It'll never get wider than that uh, in its whole life. Um, so again, that's, uh, that's called the establishment period when it's still very low to the ground. Palms attain their maximum girth during this stage and then go through elongation. Uh, the stem is considered woody, although it is different anatomically from the wood of hardwoods or conifer trees. Uh, cells in the stem thicken and strengthen as they age, adding to the rigidity of the, of the trunk. The stem is capable of storing starches in the parenchyma cells. So even though it's not storing weight energy in old xylem tissue, sapwood, it can still store it in the parenchyma cells. Uh, and if you recall, that's what sort of wrapped around these vascular bundles. Movement of water and minerals is not restricted to the outside of the trunk. 
So the entire diameter of that palm tree is the vascular system. Uh, there is no heartwood in a palm. Uh, palms do not have the capability uh, of compartmentalization. Remember those compartments, those walls were developed uh, over eons based on uh, the anatomy of the vascular system. And this just, this uh, palms are just a totally different creature. Uh, so as a result, uh, the resistance to decay result is the result of just the strength of the individual uh, fibers and the hardening of the, sh and the sheathing fibers of the vascular bundles. They have one apical meristem. Uh, I get a call a lot after, after hurricanes uh, hey, the top blew out, but I still have some leaves up there. Is my palm going to live? And the answer is no, it's not uh, because that the apical meristem is gone. It can't be replaced. Uh, occasionally, you might have some, uh, some weird type of bifurcation that occurs in a palm, and you might have um, a meristem that's produced off to the side, but that's, that's sort of a rare and it's more of a genetic defect than it is uh, anything else. Uh, the primary bud is protected by the overlapping uh, leaf bases of the emerging fronds. I'm sure you've all seen the palms. They kind of look like a fountain. Uh, the leaves at the very top pointed upwards are the newest ones and the ones hanging down to the side are the oldest ones. Uh, photosynthesis takes place uh, only in the fronds. That's where the green chloroplasts are. Fronds consist of the blade, the petiole, and the leaf base. Leaves are produced sequentially. Uh, so as the new ones are produced, it pushes them to the outside, pushes the older ones to the outside and down. Uh, and they have, uh, palms have the largest leaves of any tree. Flowers and fruit emerge in or below the crown from the leaf axles. Uh, the upper angle between the leaf and the stem. Uh, leaf scars uh, or nodes would be where you might find uh, these, these fruit flower emergence. Flowers are clustered into large aggregates of many flowers. You might see uh, thousands and thousands of uh, flowers on a palm tree, uh, but the fruit itself might be very small uh, berry size, or it could be as large, obviously, as a coconut. Um, some palms flower once in their whole life and then they die, uh, but typically uh, fruit is produced in very large numbers year to year. Uh, the root system is very different from hardwood trees. Palm roots lack secondary growth. Uh, roots other than the primary seedling roots are adventitious. Uh, they just keep developing. If you see in the picture, the diameter of these roots as they come off of the main trunk, that same diameter of root is maintained for the height of the tree in all directions, uh, or sometimes multiple times. Uh, so you can see where the roots might be very, very thick in the soil, uh, forming what's called a root mat. Uh, most of the roots initiate in the top uh, 12 to 18 inches of the soil. Uh, and uh, they will re-sprout when they're cut. So if we cut some of these roots, it's gonna sprout out a new root associations. Uh, I didn't get into a lot of the specifics of the different types of mycorrhizae, but there are endomycorrhizal relationships, ectomycorrhizal relationships. All plants have some mycorrhizal relationship. Uh, without that mycorrhizal relationship, the plants just don't thrive. So that brings us to the end of the chapter of biology, and I hit it right at 10 o'clock. So uh, this chapter can actually go on for quite some time. So you can see where I've kind of condensed it, but do we have any questions out there? I'm gonna stop sharing and give it back to you. Thank you. Yes, so far I don't have any questions. Um, if anyone doesn't have any questions, feel free. I'm going to uh, start a 10 minute break. I will be sure to give you a five minute uh, verbal warning before we get started uh, while we switch over to uh, Kay, uh, who's going to move into her next chapter. And I'll, uh, and I'll hang around through, through the break in case anybody has questions after the break. I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome.
everybody. Uh, we're at about a five minute warning. So just a heads up for everybody to start getting settled. We'll start back in five minutes. One minute warning everybody before we get started.
All right, everybody, I'm going to hand it on over to Kay Ivanovich, who is going to pick us up with our tree ID chapter. Uh, that's chapter two of your course book. Okay, you got it? Yep. Hello, everybody. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, so I'm Kay Ivanovich, a certified arborist, track risk assessment uh, qualified, and, and the arborist for the city of Decatur, uh, Georgia. So I've been doing this a while, and hopefully we can get through this tree ID without too much to do. So off we go. <clears throat> All right, so let's see, start scrolling the screen, hopefully. Come on, screen. There we go. Chapter two, we're going into tree identification. So how do you, how do you figure out what trees look like? Well, you have to kind of know different parts of the tree, the tree twig, the bud, the leaf samples. Um, there are plant classifications. Um, maybe you learned some of that in school biology, maybe not, but we'll go over it again. Um, scientific names for trees, we'll talk about that. Uh, the use of plant characteristics in tree identification. How do you use all those to figure out what's what? Um, leaf arrangement and morphology, we're going to talk about that. And then leaf shapes and characteristics and bud and twig characteristics. So a lot of information to go over today. All right, so um, identify a tree always before you diagnose or treat or prescri prescribe care. Different trees are gonna require different things. Um, they may need more water, they may need less water, they may need more light, they may need less light. It just depends on the tree and the type. So you have to figure out what's what before you can start prescribing and treating. Makes sense. Doctor wouldn't actually treat you without looking at you, right? Same thing for trees and knowing what you look like and, and are you a person, or are you a dog, or are you a what? So we'll go on from there. Um, let's see, diseases, pests, cultural requirements, um, all of that can vary among species. There are certain pests that don't attract any other kind of tree but one. Um, there are certain pests that attack just about everything except pine trees. So we'll go over a little bit of that too. Um, the ability of, uh, to ID trees requires extensive knowledge. It, it requires uh, experience, patience, exposure to woody landscape plants. So if you've never been out with trees, you might need to start visiting some trees. Um, and different times of the year, you know, it's not enough to look up a tree species in, in just spring or just summer when it's leafed out. You really have to start looking at the bark. What does it look like in winter? How does the tree branch form? What shape does the tree take? All these things are gonna help you ID them in winter. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about that. So the first thing we're gonna go over is taxonomy or plant classification. Um, it's based on biological characteristics of the trees, so plants. Um, it starts off with a kingdom, which is either animal or plant. In this case, we're dealing with plants. Um, division or phylum, which is gonna be vascular or non-vascular. Um, then we go down to subdivision of vascular, and in that you have two groups, angiosperms and gymnosperms, and then below that you have classes, and so the angiosperms are broken down even farther into dicotyledon, uh, dicotyledons and monocotyledons, and we'll go over that in a minute too. Um, then it goes down to orders below that, um, then you go into families, so that would be similar flowers and fruits on trees. Um, and then you have your genus. Uh, most of that is what we're familiar with. You know, very similar, um, especially in reproductive structures, all within that same genus. And then below that, you have your species. Now you're thinking, how am I going to remember all this? Well, there's a kind of a, a way that we we teach this, where you have it broken out into uh, a little uh, tail. So we're going to do King David Philip. So kingdom, division, or phylum. King David Philip came over for good soup. <laughs> it's the easiest way to remember it. King David Philip, I'll say it again, came over, so that's your class and order, for, um, is your family, good, is your genus, soup, species, right? It's just a way to remember it. Okay. So let's talk first about the kingdom. Uh, is your, like I said, we break that into plant um, and then Below that, it is broken into division or phylum. So vascular plants and non-vascular plants is what we're dealing with for division or phylum. Plants with a xylem and phloem are vascular plants. Angiosperms um, are plants with seeds covered by an ovary or fruit, right? They're flowering plants. Most of our deciduous trees, most of our trees that shed leaves, oaks, hickory, that kind of thing, broad-leafed evergreens, 
um, those are going to be angiosperms, okay? Gymnosperms are plants with naked seeds. Oh, she said naked. Anyway, um, plants with naked seeds, yes, like cone-bearing plants such as ginkgos and conifers, right? Think about it. Your, your little seed comes out of the cone and it's totally naked. There's no current casing around it. There's no fruit around it. Um, and it just kind of wings itself down. Gymnosperms. So that's what we're dealing with with those two. All right. So in the phylum, we break it down further. Um, gymnosperms are conifers such as juniper, cedar, and pine. Um, there are two major classes of trees uh, with the gymnosperms and angiosperms, um, both which are found in the south. So we have both of them here in the south. We're lucky. Gymnosperms are often called evergreens or softwoods. Um, the angiosperms include hardwoods, palms, and yuccas, right? Um, let's see, the, like I said, the gymnosperms, keep in mind, have naked seeds, referring to the unenclosed condition of the seeds. Um, as when they are produced, they are found naked on the scales of the cone or similar structure. Um, a ginkgo, which is kind of unique uh, in that it is the, the only living fossil tree, or one of the only living fossil trees, and they've been around in that form that the ginkgo is now with us here today uh, for about 51 million years. Jurassic evidence has been found of that tree looking exactly the same way. So kind of cool. But uh, anyway, um, it, it is one of the only species um, that has that wonderfulness. Um, all right, and then you have things like uh, the seed bearing plants um, in the angiosperms. And, and angio, just so you know, angion, angion comes from the Greek, um, which means container. So you can think of it that way. Angio is a container, it's contained within something. Um, they have an uh, ovule, they are enclosed uh, in a carapel, and then the carapel consists of a stigma, a style, and the ovary. Again, think back to science class. Um, you're going to be hearing a lot of those terms over again. Um, but that's the main difference. Angiosperms um, have, are going to include most flowering plants, um, including uh, broadleaf tree species. And then gymnosperms are your, gymnosperms are your um, cones, like you know, conifers, junipers, cedars, and pine. Now, for angiosperms, we have classes of those, too. Um, you have dicotyledons and monocotyledons. Dicot, di meaning two, right? So dicotyledons have two seeds. Um, again, most broadleaf species, um, that's what you're gonna be dealing with. And then most common tree species of the dicotyledons um, are gonna be just about everything except conifers, banana trees, and palms, right? So monocotyledons, monocots, is a one seed leaf, right? only one. Grasses, lilies, orchids, palms, um, they have their vascular tissues in, bu um, in bundles in those. So it's really kind of interesting to think that a palm tree is not really a tree. It's a grass, but we call it a tree. It is the world's biggest grass. Can you imagine having to go out and mow those? No thanks. Anyway, um, yeah, so monocotyledons, remember that, one seed leaf. Dicotyledons, two. Right? And if I haven't said it before, kind of keep attention to anything in your books and the presentations that are mentioned multiple times or underlined or italicized might help you out in the test later on. Just saying. All right, so classes, let's talk about classes. Uh, in your classes, you have order, right? And you have families under that. Plants with the same um, or similar uh, characteristics, same types of flowers and fruits. Um, the genus below that, plants that are very closely related in, in similar char characteristics, especially their reproductive structures, how they flower, how they fruit. Um, and then your species below that, um, it, that level identifies the plant, right? Um, the species name is a combination of the genus name and the specific epithet or specific name. That's what that means, specific epithet, okay? It is the name. So again, I'll say that species is a combination of the genus name and the specific epithet. All right, plant classification. Let's go down the list again. So we have the kingdom is plant, right? We're talking about trees. Phylum, it's an angiosperm. The class, 
This one is a dicotyledon, so we know it has two, right? The order is Sapindales. The family is Aceracea. The genus is Acer, and the species is Saccharinium. Now, if we were in public, I'd say, does anybody know what this is? And if you weren't looking at your screen, you maybe would know. But if you are looking at your screen and we're not live like we are now, you're already looking at your screen. And you know that that I just described is a silver maple, right? Acer saccharinium, silver maple. That's what we all know it by. Uh, well, hopefully we all know it by. And if not, you're gonna learn. Okay, nomenclature. Woohoo! Plant nomenclature. We are whipping right along here. All right, so the naming of plants. Common names, let's face it, can be confusing and misleading. And one tree may be called something here in the south and be called something totally different up north or out west or, you know, across the, across the ocean in Europe. Um, but the interesting thing is, even though they may have several common names, like, carp, you know, American hornbeam, blue beech, ironwood, musclewood, that Carpinius carolinia or caroliniana is the same over the entire globe. So somebody in Germany is talking along, Grüß Gott, wie geht's? How is, uh, wie bist du? Carpinius carolinia, right? He may call it something else later on, but he's going to call it the same thing you are when you're talking to somebody. Hi, how is your Carpinius carolinia, carolinia who, I can't talk today, caroliniana doing? You know, how is your American hornbeam if you're up north? I think they call it that mostly. Um, or here we call it that too. And ironwood, I think, is out west. So, but it's the same everywhere you go. Tulip tree, um, magnolia, uh, solangelina, or solangelina. Oh, I can't, like I said, I'm going to have to slow down because I just can't get these words out today. My apologies. Magnolia solangiana. That's one that's a mouthful. Uh, Lyrodendron tulipifera, right? So only the tulip tree is one or the other of those two genus names. It's not both. So you need to know which one it is. Um, a Douglas fir, funny enough, it's not a Douglas, it's not a fir at all. <laughs> a bald cypress is not a cypress. Well, we do these crazy things with these common names. And mountain ash is not an ash tree. So you gotta have to learn um, maybe like me, you're going to have trouble saying them, but at least you know what they are. Those common names and the, the actual names that we need to use as all of those. So uh, common names are not capitalized unless they are included, unless they include a proper name and should not be italicized. Um, you see a lot of people writing reports trying to throw everything into italization. It doesn't need it. Um, it's just a river birch in this example. Um, its cultivar names may be Betula nigra cully. Um, that's its cul um, cultivar. Um, but that can't be trademarked because everybody knows it as Betula nigra, right? Um, but common names can be trademarked. So when they create a new variety of Betula nigra, right, and it's the heritage river birch, then they can copyright heritage because they created it. But Betula nigra, is everybody's, right? They can't copyright that. That's the tree's name all over the world. Trademark names are never written using single quotations, right? It's just the Tula Nigra heritage with the copy mark, copyright mark. So like I said, keep that in mind. Trademark names are never written using single quotations. It would be the Tula Nigra heritage. All right, scientific names. Each plant, like I said, has a scientific name that is the same throughout the world. Um, and it's based on the species classification system. Sugar maple is always gonna be Acer saccharum, no matter where you go. Uh, good eye, mate, how's your Acer saccharum? Yeah, it's gonna be the same in Spain too. Yeah, so there you go, enough said. Hybrids, well, let's see. Hybrids are the result of crossbreeding between two different species, um, usually from the same genus. Uh, it's usually written with an X between the genus and the specific epithet. Like in this example, you have Acer frimani, Jeffers red. So it's a cross between the frimani and the Acer. Um, we had a similar situation here in, um, in Decatur at our historic cemetery. We had a beautiful what half the arborists in the group of 20 that have looked at it said was a red 
oak, uh, southern red oak, and the other half said, no, it's a scarlet oak. Um, and what we determined was it, is, it was an old uh, southern red oak and an old scarlet oak, and they cross-pollinated, and we got that combination of a hybrid. So it had leaves that resembled the northern red, I mean southern red, and leaves that resembled the scarlet. Um, so it was really a unique little thing. Um, and that happened. So species, going on, uh, subspecies, um, naturally occurring a closely related group within a species found in the same geographic range, but there are some distinctly different characteristics, like a black maple is a subspecies of sugar maple. Um, it looks a lot like it, it flowers the same, um, but it's got some small differences. Um, its form, um, similar to subspecies, but less distinct varieties. So form may be a little different. Uh, red flowering dogwood is a little bit different than a white flowering dogwood um, in form. Uh, uh, so same, same kind of thing. Varieties, um, different varieties, subdivision of species that has a trait distinctly different from the other plants within the species and naturally breeds true to that trait. So it happens over and over and over and over again. Um, that's, a, that's a variety. It always breeds true to that trait um, that's distinctly different. Um, cultivars like little gem magnolia um, would be a cultivar, little gem. Uh, cultivated varieties that require human intervention. So we get involved in that with asexual propagation to reproduce a trait. Um, genetically identical cone, clones, they're all little clone plants. All the little gems look exactly alike. Um, and we create that. So cultivar is little gem, and that's always gonna be one that we, we actually created and it does the same trait over and over again. All right, principles of woody plant ID. It's based on morphology. So it's based on the size, shape, and appearance of a plant, or tree in this case. Leaves and form are extremely useful. Um, remember that X current, D current that he talked about earlier? That all comes into play. Um, leaves and form are useful. What do the leaves look like? How are they attached? Um, how many of them are there? Are they waxy? Are they, are they hairy underneath? Um, are they, you know, gray green? Are they dark green? You know, um, they're extremely useful in ID. The problem is in winter, they're not there. So you got to know other things. Um, but botanical classification is based on reproductive structures. Um, so you can look at your flowers and fruit if it's that time of year for that plant. Extremely helpful. Um, you use all of it, though, to determine um, you can use form, how it grows, bark, what does the bark look like, buds on the, on the branches and twigs, twigs, leaves, flowers, fruit, even the smell. I know it sounds nuts, but here when we're walking sites and I see these little whips coming up, you know, little young trees, um, if it's a, a, a heck, tulip poplar, it's the most bizarre thing. If you break off a little bit of it, it smells like pepper. It's the most odd thing in the world, but that's how it smells to me. And it's same thing with sweet gum, you know, obviously I know the leaf now, but if you've, ever, if you've ever not done it, take a sweet gum leaf and crunch it up. It has a distinctive odor and you'll never forget it once you smell it. Um, just things like that. So you're going to use all of that to figure out what kind of tree am I dealing with here. Important tree characteristics, um, obviously we talked about um, form, how it branches. Does it, is it X current? Is it D current? Um, is it spread? Is it rounded? Is it, you know, pyramidical? All these things are going to help you. Um, leaves. What are your leaf margins looks like? What does your leaf base look like? What about the apex? And like I said earlier, is it hairy underneath or not? All those things are going to help you identify the species. Um, buds, twigs, pith inside the, the twig, right? What does the pith look like? Different trees have different pith patterns and looks. Um, bark, like I said, all we, we all know those are different. Um, flowers and fruit, all that can be different. So those are important characteristics to remember when you're doing tree ID. Now, ID at a distance, um, that's the way I usually start off doing uh, a check to see what a tree is. Um, you're looking for how it grows, your form, your branching characteristics, your growth habit. Um, elms are almost always vase-shaped. Um, sugar, sugar maples in the fall, there's no, there's no denying what they are. They're, they have that beautiful color. 
Um, live oak, oh my gosh, with those big branches that spread and drop to the ground. Um, you're not going to see too much like that. That's, you know, if you haven't been down to Savannah, Georgia, and that whole coastal area to see those live oaks, Jekyll Island is a, a, an incredible thing to go look at with the live oaks down there in Savannah and, and that coastal area. Um, and Spanish moss, because that grows on those trees. Um, it'll grow on other trees too, but, but it's, you can almost always find it on a live oak too. So identification tree form. Now I was talking about, and, and he was talking about earlier, X current and D current, right? So uh, live oak, coastal savanna, perfect example of a, a D current, right? They have a strong, typical, uh, uh, I mean, branching form, right? And then, you know, X current trees have a strong apical dominance. You know, I always think of it like X current. In my own head, I'm thinking lightning, if it was a current, would go straight down this trunk, right? But if it's a decurrent, that would break that lightning up, how it branches off. It's just something I use to help me remember things. So X current, D current, that's kind of how you can remember it. Leaf arrangement. Um, leaf arrangement, you're dealing with uh, red maple on this example. Oops, I'm on the wrong page, sorry. Leaf arrangement, uh, leaf is determined by the presence of a bud where it attaches to the stem. A simple leaf uh, is gonna be a single one part, one blade, or one needle, et cetera, leaf that is not subdivided into little leaflets or more needles. Right? It's going to just be one simple leaf. Compound leaf is going to be two or more leaflets, but only a single bud or cluster of buds at the base of that petiole. So keep that in mind. A compound leaf is going to be a bud, single bud or cluster of buds at the base of the petiole. Right? And compound means two. There's going to be two or more. Right? Right. Oh, leaf arrangement. Now we're looking at the page I was almost on. And Got a little confused. All right, leaf arrangements. So you have opposite, how they're attached on the branch, they're totally uh, directly opposite of each other. Um, you have alternate, which is they're coming off that twig or branch at every other intersection, right? So they're not directly across from each other. They're not opposite of each other. They're alternating up the branch. Um, and then you have simple, uh, simple leaf, like this silver maple leaf. And then you have a compound, perfect example of that. Right, that's a catalpa, um, or um, that's a catalpa tree. It's a world uh, arrangement. So there you go. Those are those two. Leaf and bud arrangement. Uh, you have. <laughs> this is always fun to remember. Leaf and bud arrangements. So you have opposite leaf and bud arrangements. There's only five of them. Mad horse. Just remember mad horse. Maple, ash, dogwood, horse chestnut. Mad horse are all opposites. How many of them? Five, that's right. Mad horse, all right? Alternate is just about every other species. Um, and I don't know why they say just, you know, most other species, it, except for those five, right? Yeah. Um, if you find something that's not one of those five and, and has opposite, then let me know. <laughs> all right, anyway, going on, mad horse, don't forget, maple, ash, dogwood, horse chestnut, opposite. All right, so trees with opposite leaf arrangement, like we just went over, and you notice they've repeated this. Hmm, what did I say earlier? Anyway, <clears throat> trees with opposite leaf arrangement, mad horse, maple, ash, dogwood, horse, chestnut. All right, I don't want to beat a dead horse on. <laughs> I can't believe I said that. All right, moving on. <clears throat> conifer needle arrangement. All right, conifer, cone bearing trees, right? Cone bearing trees. Pines. Pinus have needles arranged in clusters of two, three, or five, right? Sp uh, spruce, picea, or fir, abies, produces needles singularly, right? So there's only one of them coming off the branch, like it shows in the example, um, where the pines may have two or three or five stuck together with that nice little binding coming off the branch. Um, short, sharp, single, square needles, and they do hurt. <laughs> Spurs trees are awful. Love them for Christmas, but man, uh, they can sure stab you, uh, and it's not fun. Um, but they sure smell pretty. Um, other conifers may have an all-like scale, kind of flat looking, like this Thugia example, um, a Thugia example at the bottom. 
right? They're kind of flat, scale-like um, foliage. It's a way to remember them. Leaf morphology, let's talk a little bit about that. So leaf morphology, um, you have basically a midrib and venation on the plant, right? So you have your petiole that the leaf is attached to at the base. And then you have the margins along the side, which may be, you know, there, there, there's going to be all kinds of different little shapes that there may be there in that margin. You have the apex at the very top. And again, that can be shaped very differently. Um, the blades that come off, the veins that come off you know, in the mid, uh, is different on different leaves. Um, and this particular one is a populus deltoids. So that's a, a tulip poplar, basically, or a poplar tree. Um, knowing the parts of the leaf will help with tree identification. So kind of go over this and make yourself familiar with the parts of the leaf, right, for a simple leaf. Uh, the lamina is the blade or broad part of the leaf. The leaf is attached to the twig with a supporting stalk that's called a petiole. Um, it may either be short or long. It can grow in a variety of different shapes, which may not exist in some trees, right? Some petioles um, enclose next season's bud at the base of the petiole. Um, when the leaf is attached directly to the twig rather than to the petiole, it's said to be sessile, but that's just so that you, you've heard of that before. Um, stipules are a pair of small, scaly leaf like organism or, or organs, well, leaf like organs that may be attached to the twig on either side of the petiole. Um, some stipules will leave scars that are visible on the twig in the winter, so that helps to ID the tree, right? Um, plants that have stipules are called stipulate, imagine that, um, while those without them are called estipulate, so stipulate and estipulate. Um, but anyway, Main thing is to look at this picture and kind of familiarize yourself with the blade, petiole, base, the margins, and the apex. It's going to tell you a lot about what you're dealing with and what kind of tree it is. So the leaf margins, let's talk about that a little bit. So you've got the entire leaf, right? So it's a rounded kind of smooth. Then you have serrated leaves, right? Which are kind of like a knife blade, if you think of it that way. Uh, your kitchen knife is serrated that you use to cut your steak. Well, there's different types of serrated leaves. There's serrulate, which if you look down, you'll find um, not in this picture. Interesting, so you might want to look that one up. Um, a double serrate, uh, which is going to have kind of extra extra little pieces. It, it kind of reminds me more of a, a, a double saw blade of some sort. Um, and then you have uh, coarse serrate, coarsely serrated, um, which looks more like an actual saw blade on a, you know, wood, wood saw. And um, you have dent, dentate and creonate. Um, so creonate is kind of a more I don't know, it's a neat little, it's kind of how people draw clouds a lot of times in my, in my head. Um, and lobed, of course, you're gonna be looking like your oak, oak leaves. A lot of them are lobed. Um, so undulated, undulate or undulated leaves um, and lobed leaves. So these are all the leaf margins. And you can see there's a, a it breaks down even further than this. This isn't exactly all of them um, for the leaf margins, but it's a good way to identify trees if you can remember. Okay, let's see, the silver maple has this double coarsely serrated or, or double serrate um, leaf edge, then you can say, oh yeah, okay, that's that one. Um, but anyway, just keep that in mind that they're all different and they help you ID the tree. All right, leaf base, like I talked about, those can all be different too, where it, you know, at the very end of the leaf. So it can be acute, um, it can be uh, co rounded, chordate, oblique, um, auriculated, um, which is kind of a, a auriculate leaf, I guess, would, would kind of look like the bottoms of a four-leaf clover, the way that attaches. That's how it looks. It's kind of lobed, even though they didn't give you a picture of it here. Um, but just take a look at these, familiarize yourself with how they look, and it, it all goes to help in tree ID. Okay? Leaf morphology for the shape. 
So the shape of the leaf is very helpful. Um, most broadleaf trees are gonna have that kind of rounded look, right? It's a broad leaf after all, right? It's not a straight pine needle or linear shaped leaf. There are some linear shaped leaves in oaks and broadleaf trees, but you know, like, it comes to mind the willow oak um, can have that linear type leaf. Um, and there's several others, but just knowing the shape of your leaf, whether it's oval, oblong, um, ovate, or obovate, um, kind of helps you identify the tree, right? Same thing for the conifers. Is it scale-like, like we talked about on the other ones, all-like? Um, is it linear? Is it needle-like? Um, and how it attaches is going to help you ID the tree. So the shape is your leaf morphology. Leaf apex. Um, you've got different ends of that too. So how, how does the leaf point look, right? Is it, is it cuminate, acute, obtuse, truncated, or cuspidated, right? Um, some of these words are really fun to say too. Uh, anyway, um, just looking at it, and again, this is all helping you ID the tree. So you see the leaf, you know what it looks like. It's one of these, and you can go back to your guide or online and say, yes, it has this, no, it doesn't and it helps you to break down what type tree this actually is. All right, compound leaves. <clears throat> so we've got a little bit to talk about here. Uh, pinnate leaf compound leaves have leaflets oppositely arranged on either side of the petiole, okay? Uh, even pinnate, six, eight, and 10 leaflets, like the walnut jug uh, jugulans, um, uh, or juglands, uh, is going to be an even pinnate tree. Okay? Um, odd pinnates, five, seven, and nine leaflets in number, um, and it has usually a terminal single leaflet, um, would be like Cara, that species. Um, a, pin a pinnate leaf compound leaf has leaflets arranged laterally on the rachis. Okay? A leaf with an odd number of leaflets on the rachis is called an odd pinnate leaf. Odd pinnate. Right? Um, a box elder tree has odd pinnate leaves. There's an example. Box elder is an odd pinnate. Um, well, let's see. What else did I want to say about these? A leaf with an even number of leaflets is called a pinnate, um, such as the hornless um, common honey locust. And actually, it's thornless. The <laughs> my computer, thornless hun uh, common honey locust, not hornless. I don't know many trees that run around like unicorns. Anyway, thornless common honey locust is a um, a leaf with an even number of leaflets, um, and it's an even pinnate. All right, if that helps to remember things. Um, a bi binately uh, compound leaf, bipinnately sorry, compound leaf has multiple leaflets attached to a leaf bearing stalk off the ratchet, ratchets, um, such as a mimosa tree, right? So binately compound, multiple leaflets attached to a leaf bearing stalk off the ratchets. You can think of mimosa, right? Um, and then palmately compound leaves, each leaflet attached to a common point, such as a buckeye tree, right? That's gonna be a palmately compound leaf. Oh, it's a lot to talk about, isn't it? All right, so I would go over this and, and kind of pay attention to the ones they've given you pictures of. And just go over how they look and try and keep that in your mind, all right? But it really does help for tree ID. All right, leaf morphology, uh, compound leaves. What fun. Um, so binately compound honey locust is a binately compound, okay? There's a good example. Um, a palmately compound is a buckeye. So again, good example. Pal palmately compound is a buckeye. And then pinately compound is a hickory. So it's given you three good examples. And again, I'll say that one more time. Bipinately compound honey locust. Palmately compound is a buckeye. And pinately compound is a hickory. Okay. Okay, let's talk about some leaf characteristics. All right, Quercus virginiana on the left, and then you see the Sassafras albidium on the right. 
Sassafras is a unique little plant that, as you notice, has three different leaf shapes. And I'm going to tell you a quick little story about that. There's a, a legend in the Native American tribes that talks about, down here in the south, talks about how this tree got three leaves. Um, and it does seem a little peculiar, and you know, I'm sure it evolved over time, but the legend says that there was a, a first man and first woman, and it got kind of cold up in the mountains uh, in the south, and so he couldn't hunt. He, his hands were too cold to pull the bow. So his wife asked the creator for help, and the creator said, go out to the tree, the sassafras tree, and it'll give you what you need. And she went out there, and sure enough, there was this first leaf just round, and it was big enough to make a mitten out of. So she made a mitten for him, and he said, oh, this is great. These will keep my hands warm. And he went out to try and pull the bow and hunt, but he couldn't, he couldn't pull the bow with it in a mitten. He couldn't do the arrow. He couldn't hang on to it. He needed a thumb. So he went back to his wife and said, this won't work. It keeps him warm, but I can't draw the bow to hunt. And she says, okay, I'll, I'll talk to the creator. So she prays to the creator again, and the creator says, go back to the sassafras tree. And sure enough, she went back to the tree and there was that big mitten with a thumb on it, right? That big leaf with the thumb on it. And so she took that and made him mittens with thumbs. And sure enough, he went out and he said, oh, these are great. And he could pull the bow, but he couldn't knock the arrow. He needed that extra finger, right? Couldn't knock it on either side. So he went back and he said, I still have a problem. He said, I, I still can't do this. I need that extra finger. And so again, she prays to the creator and the creator says, okay, go back to the sassafras tree. It'll give you what you need. And then he creates this three so that he's actually got three pieces of the mitten. She makes him the mitten and then he can knock the arrow and pull the bow and he can hunt and live and be happy. So that's the legend of the sassafras and why it has three leaves. So I digress. But again, knowing that that sassafras has three different leaf types, when you encounter it, you're going to go, oh, that's a sassafras, right? All right. Okay, so what is this big guy? Let's see what it looks like right? It's got, hmm, it's got how many leaves and how are they attached? Uh, let's see, might that be a, I hope you're all guessing. Well, if you guess that this is an umbrella tree or a cucumber magnolia, um, you're correct. Um, and that, that's what knowing these things will help you learn when you see this tree out in the woods. Right. Okay, deciduous trees in winter. You are going to need to be familiar with something besides those doggone leaves because they're not going to be there unless it's an evergreen. And those are really easy to do in the winter. <laughs> it's also really easy to see if they're dead in the winter because if they're not green, they're dead. Um, okay, so going on, um, except for, now there is one exception to that, and that is. Uh, a deciduous evergreen. And I wonder if anybody can, can think of that. Um, if you thought of Dawn Redwood, you're correct. And look that up if you haven't looked it up. It's a neat tree. Anyway, in winter, you need to know the bark, the branching habits, the twigs, the buds, the fruit may still be pr present, the pitch. If there's pitch on the tree, that might help you to ID it. Um, so in winter, that's what you're going to have to know, right? Um, you've got the winter bud morphology. So this is going to help you a lot. Uh, this particular tree is really easy to see in winter, the green ash. It always reminds me that it's wearing a hat at the end of the, um, at the tree with the bud. That's what it looks like to me. It looks like it's wearing a little hat. Um, but it, that's its terminal bud, right? So it's covered over, ready to come out in spring, push out and become leaves, right? And keep growing and come on and be another twig and tree and buds and leaves and all that stuff. It's all trapped in that terminal bud. Um, below that, you can see it has little bud scales, right? Um, below that on the twig, you're going to see lateral buds that'll pop out and be little branches or leaves coming off that, right? There's going to be a leaf scar. You can see that really well um, below each one of these little buds. And below the terminal bud is the leaf scar where the leaf broke away um, when it was time to let go, right? Um, and those are all different on, the, on different trees. So different trees have different bud scars. I mean, leaf scars. They have different bud types. They have different leaf scars. Um, the rings of the bud scale from um, scars from previous year's terminal bud. So it's going to have that line across that you see right above where it says green ash. That's where last year's um, terminal bud was that 
came out, pushed out, and kept going. So just things to remember. You've got the nodes in between that he, talk, he talked about earlier, um, internode areas. But the main thing to help you with that leaf idea is going to be that bundle trace leaf scar, right? Or the, um, the terminal bud, right? It's going to look exactly the same on every green ash. It's going to look just like that. So just things to keep in mind. All right. Palms, let's talk about those giant grasses. <laughs> there's thousands of species of them. Um, there's more than 200 uh, genera. Um, it's native to all continents except Antarctica, right? Just too darn cold up there. Um, most are single stem, but some can be multi-stem. Um, some are shrubby, others are kind of vine-like, uh, and some can grow more than 200 feet tall. Um, most palm leaves, or fronds as they're called, are compound, and they're either palmate or pinnate, right? So if you think of the two, um, the, the palmate, let me see if I can uh, ring that for you. So the palmate is wide, like the palm of your hand. That's how I remember that, palmate, it's palm-like. And then the other one, pinnate, is like a feather. It's kind of pinnated, right? And it's the same kind of feather thing, the shape that, that ducks on their pin feathers have, right? Pinnate. So palmate or pinnate, just ways to remember it. And that helps you ID which type palm it is. So tree identification keys. All right. So with tree identification keys, um, you're using a step-by-step -step method for identifying plants. So literally, um, it's describing the shape, texture, arrangement of leaves, bud characteristics, twig shape, morphology of flowers and fruits. And it's a flow chart um, on a tree identification key. Some of them are written. Um, now we have really good ones online that you can use too, but you should still know how to use the written ones in case one day that's all you've got, right? You don't have your computer with you. Um, you got to go back to a book that's in your trunk. Right? It's always good to have one, um, but it's a step-by-step -step method. So you're looking at, uh, okay, the shape of the tree is X current. No, it's D current. No, it's, it's pyramidical. Uh, no, it's rounded. And it, okay, it's a rounded tree. So does it have um, a leaf arrangement that is Palmate, um, yeah, what is it? How does it look? Is it pinnate? Is it, uh, you know, a dicotyledon, a monocotyledon? Wh what is this thing? And you're going by each one, and then it says, okay, if it's got this, then go to that. Um, and then the bark, does the bark look like this? Yes, then go to that. If it doesn't look, no, then go to that. Um, so you just, it's a key that you're going down. I hope that makes sense. Kind of like a flow chart, and it's a yes or no answer. Um, and here's an example of a page out of, out of a key, right? So there's your dicotyledon, a, um, and you're looking as, does it have a plant without chlorophyll? And then you go to key one. Um, is it a plant in flower with leaves absent? You go to key two, that's how it's read. Um, and then you're going on down. If you had to go to key two, then are the leaves opposite, rarely whirled? Are the flowers in catkins with compact heads? Um, are the flowers not in cat heads with compact heads? Then it's telling you to go to these different pages. It could be this, it could be that. It just keeps going with your yes and no's until you get to the one where you go, oh, that's what it is. All right, so that's how tree uh, keys are used, or tree ID keys. Um, you need a certain level of, of expertise um, to understand the terms um, to ID the plants correctly on those tree identification keys. Um, the plant may not match its written characteristics exactly because of seasonal differences, right, in plant color or morphology. Um, and not all keys have all trees that might be found in a given region. Um, that's why it's kind of cool with the ones that are online because they're adding new information all the time, right? Um, um, so, you know, those are things to keep in mind if you're using an actual tree identification book type key. Um, genetic um, variability, plant condition, location and the environment can also affect the size of the plant and the parts. If you've never looked at small young trees, their leaves are usually, especially broad, uh, broad leaves, are usually twice as big as they are when they get big and, and adult and mature um, because they're trying to get as much light as they can. So they spread that leaf out in these huge sizes, right? Tulip poplars come to mind. Um, they put out a huge leaf when they're young. And by the time they're older, you know, it shrinks down to about that size. So, 
you know, they're going to be different the younger they are, the older they are. Um, if they're in an area where they're getting a lot of water, they may look different. If they're in an area where they're not getting enough water, they're going to look different. So all those things have to be taken into account. A lot to figure out. And I think we're done with triage. So are there any questions? I'm going to look over the chat. Let's see. Yeah, I think, Kay, uh, someone was interested in uh, that magnolia, that large leaf magnolia, uh, I think cucumber. Yeah, what class? Back to that. Doo, 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 doo. Oh, tulip magnolia. Um, uh, umbrella magnolia, sorry. Um, and what is that one? Let's see. That's an umbrella magnolia I was talking about. Is that is that what he meant? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, let me look that up real quick for you. Because, you know, even me, it, having been doing this for 20 plus years, I can't keep them all in my head. So, but I know that was an umbrella magnolia. Magnolia, saucer, no, yeah, that's it. Umbrella magnolia. We uh, have a vote from Fred that says magnolia accumulate. Hmm, interesting. All right, well, let's see. In this one, it said tripletta, but we'll see. Ooh, umbrella bag. Oh, yeah. oh. And Fred is saying it's a accumulate, huh? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Or right, he's asking. Too. Yeah. I was told okay. it's, a, it's mm -hmm. an umbrella, you know, magnolia. But you know, Fred, I'll take a look at the other one and let you know. <laughs> or you can look it up too and let me know either way you know because that's all part of tree id is going and looking it up you know if you don't know you got to look for it um there's a couple of uh, tree keys that I'll, I'll let you know about real quick that uh, have helped me a lot tree id is one of them um uh let's see plant a uh, plant net is another one and these are all available as downloads on your apps for your phone and things like that um, PlantNet is a really good one. You can even upload your own um, pictures and it'll help you figure out what something is. Um, so, yeah. Um, was there any other questions that I needed to go over? I don't see any more in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, if anyone has any final questions, please go ahead and submit those. Um, do want to go ahead and take this opportunity to point you to the chat, everyone. Um, I sent out the link. Uh, it's a virtual sign-in sheet, so uh, that link will be live for 24 hours. So please, whenever you have a moment, uh, go in and use that sign-in sheet uh, so we can get you accounted for. Okay. I don't right. think we've got anybody else. Well, thank